everyone. Is this, is this working fine? Everyone can hear me? Great. Um, so welcome to this panel. Uh, this is our, our first time doing a uh, stop in our Normalizing Descent Tour, so we're really excited. Um, I'm going to be doing a little bit of a dual role here. I'm a little bit of a moderator, but I'm also participating in the panel itself. Um, but before we start, um, I wanted to first of all thank you, Sean, and um, the Secular Students and Skeptic Society for hosting us. Uh, this is amazing, and we really want to be part of this conversation, and we really want to be talking to students. So it's awesome that we're here and for all the work that they've put through to make this happen. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about Ex-Muslims of North America. Uh, we are a 501c3 registered nonprofit, and we exist to serve the needs of ex-Muslims. Um, some of you might not know uh, who ex-Muslims are, what that means exactly, but it's people who uh, used to believe in Islam, former Muslims uh, who left the religion. Ex-Muslims in North America exclusively serves non-theists, um, that is people that have left, uh, no longer adhere to any sort of religion. Uh, we build communities, we advocate for the acceptance of religious dissent, and we aim to reduce discrimination that's faced by ex-Muslims and those who leave Islam. Um, and this topic today, modesty, Islam, and feminism, is kind of a kind of a hot topic. Um, you guys probably notice if you've seen the hijab, especially as something that's very central to the debate about Islam. And there's this idea that there is maybe a little bit of a conflict there. So what we're hoping uh, with the normalizing dissent tour is to touch on topics like this. And here today, I have. Um, two wonderful panelists, Gada and Hiba, and they're going to be telling you a little bit about uh, their perspective on the issue and how we can move forward uh, in this debate. So without further ado, I'm going to give them just a little bit of time to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about their story, then I'll share mine, and then we'll move forward to the discussion. Afterwards, there'll be a question and answer session. So as you think up of something you might be curious about, please let us know, and then we'll, we'll move on to that uh, towards the end. So um, Gada, I'll let you, I'll let you begin. Uh, hello, everyone. I think I have mine. That's you guys hear me pretty yeah, well. All right. So um, my name is Gada. I. Okay, sorry about that. How about now? You can take. <laughs> hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gada. I grew up. Uh, I was born, raised, and I grew up also in the eastern province in Saudi Arabia. I grew. I was born to devout Muslim parents. Both my parents were educated. My mother, for example, was a doctor, and my father uh, lived seven years in the United States doing his degrees, and my grandfather as well. When I was a young child, I was never given choices when it came to religion. Everything was a commandment. For example, I was in the first grade, I was uh, taught to pray. When I became a little older, around second or third grade, it was compulsory now for me to pray on my own. And when I didn't pray, there was punishment. When I was in the second grade, the same thing with fasting. And when I reached the age of nine, hijab was also compulsory. Whenever I asked my mother, for example, why did I have to wear the hijab and you know, my brothers didn't have to, she told me that it was a commandment from Allah, it was wajib, and therefore there was no question about it, it was no choice. I had to do it. It wasn't that somebody forced me to do it, it was because Allah said I had to do it, therefore it's not a choice. That's what my mother used to tell me. And it wasn't just the hijab as in the cloth that you put on your, on your head. No, I had to wear long sleeves, and if just a little bit, just a little bit under the wrist would show, that was horrible. I remember on a very hot day in Saudi Arabia as I was riding in the car with my mother, my sleeve came up to just about here. And my mother looked at me in disgust. I told her, well, mom, it's hot. And she told me, well, Jahannam is hotter. <laughs> the same thing about uh, what type of clothes you wear. It has to be loose. It has to be plain. It has to fall uh, to a certain degree. If you're wearing, for example, a shirt, the shirt has to go a little bit to your knee or just a little bit above the knee. So it was all of these things that came along with it. It wasn't just, you know, put the hijab on, just whatever, and wear whatever you want. It was never that. Of course, no makeup. If I had to wear makeup, I had to uh, cover my, my face. 
After a while, they relaxed with that for some odd reason. But other things that were mandatory was you couldn't question anything in the Quran. When I, uh, I began reading the Quran yearly, especially during Ramadan, since I would like to say around middle school, I was, I think, in the seventh or eighth grade. And things like magic, that was supposed to be fact because the Quran mentions that magic is real, therefore magic is fact. Things like uh, sex before marriage, that was haram, that was a grave sin, and that should never be something that you practice. All of these things were taught to me as this is what you're supposed to do and you cannot deviate from them. I also never grew up with music. Music was also haram. So I never had the you know, boy band crushes growing up. I never uh, had a CD or listened to music on my own because I was so afraid that my parents would find out. To give you an example of how extreme they were, when, if we were to watch a movie or a TV show and the opening theme comes up, we would mute the TV because that was music. It was that bad. I wasn't introduced to music until much later when I began to question religion. And I be began to question religion when I was in high school. And what made me question religion was reading the Quran and finding out the, the difference in how the Quran reacts to women and reacts to men. How, he how the Quran addresses women and how it addresses men. And it seemed to me while I was reading the Quran is that when women are addressed as a way of how should men treat women, how should men um, you know, go about their lives with women, how they should uh, control them, how they should discipline them, and of course what women should be wearing, what they should do, etc. But there's, it's, it was so unfair to me, and that was the start of it. And uh, I came to the United States to study. I actually studied like right across the street from here in Colorado School of Mines. <laughs> And um, I graduated, and, oh, and during that time from when I was studying there is when the questioning really began to surface more and more, and experiencing freedom, and experiencing having to, being able to make a choice, being able to choose whether I wanna wear the hijab or not, being able to choose who I talk to, whether it's a boy or a, woman or a girl. That, all of that along with meeting people from all different backgrounds, that is what led me in the end to think that maybe Islam isn't the one true religion. I mean, it can't be that all of these people are gonna go to hell and only us, me, my family are gonna go to hell. And before you begin to ask to tell me that, oh, you know, you grew up in Saudi Arabia, your parents are probably Salafi. No, my parents were not Salafi or Wahhabi. My parents actually abhorred them. My parents thought that they were too extreme and uh, and, and the funny thing is, my parents were actually considered to be liberal in the sense because they let me study abroad, they let me study what I wanted, and they let me also work in a non-segregated environment when I was in Saudi Arabia. And uh, that just gives, that just gives a, a short intro about me. And now I will hand this mic to Hiba. Uh, my name is Hiba. Um, my background is actually very similar to Ghada, so I will try not to repeat any of the things that she said and touch upon different things. I'm Lebanese. Uh, my parents are uh, come from the one of the most um, religiously conservative uh, societies in the world, I think. Um, the Shia demographic in Lebanon, uh, affiliated with uh, Hezbollah, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, uh, um, as, as a child, um, I was also, you know, raised with the with the idea that my purpose and my goal as a human being was basically to please Allah and to basically follow these um, commandments, these edicts for what they imagined to be uh, a good life. Uh, like Rada, I had to start wearing hijab when I was a prepubescent child. Uh, I started around eight and a half because the Shia jurisprudence you know, unilaterally dictates that uh, hijab is mandatory for girls from the age of nine lunar years on, and this is um, absolutely not disputed in the scholarship. Um, I ended up wearing it for exactly 15 years. Um, I didn't take it off until I was uh, until I moved here to the U.S. because I kind of didn't have the chance uh, to before that. 
Um, so when I was growing up in Beirut, um, going to school, blah, 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 um, basically everything that I was allowed to do and be and want had to somehow be circumscribed around um, my identity as not just a, you know, a Muslim woman, but as a Muslim woman who subscribed to this, uh, this doctrine of purity. Um, so, so Rada mentioned that the hijab is not just a, like a, a piece of cloth. It's not just uh, a type of clothing. There is a normative aspect to it. Um, com coming with the hijab is an entire doctrine of modesty, which has elements that have to do with not just, you know, the requirements for the clothing, uh, like Rada mentioned, you know, long, loose clothing, somber colors, covering everything but the hands and the face, no uh, zina, anything decorative, no makeup, no, no like um, jewelry that stands out, etc., etc. But it also had to do with how you conducted yourself from moment to moment in your daily life. So as a hijabi, we were, uh, as a hijabi, I was expect, I and my sister, you know, all the women around me in, in our community, we were expected to behave in certain ways. Um, that meant that almost anything that we were doing with our families and, and just socially in the community was, you know, gender segregated. If we ever had like, you know, some kind of uh, social event, and I'm talking about outside of the regular religious services, generally if it was like in a, in a lecture hall like this, it would be uh, half the room divided into women, half the room divided into men. Sometimes with a curtain between, sometimes not. Even things like house visits, um, when you know, we had just family over and not even like super extended family, like, you know, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins. The women would sit on one side of the room and the men would sit on the other side of the room. Um, I was basically allowed to go to school slash work and come back home and I and not really do anything else. I wasn't allowed to have um, friends with, uh, with men. Um, and, it, you know, it was a type of thing where like, yeah, you can have, um, you can have pure interactions with members of the opposite sect, but only sex, but only, only in so far as it's like, okay, um, as much as you need to for your work or for school or whatever. Not like going out for lunch or being friends or whatever. The, just the concept of being friends with a guy was just either there was this, uh, this almost unholy stigma attached to it. Um, the, and the, when it came to the clothing and, and stuff like that, it wasn't just about how we dressed, it was also about how we bore ourselves, like our um, comportment. So we had to always be hyper aware of the way we were seated and, and, and the tone of our voice. Don't speak too loudly. Don't sit in ways that will show the shape of your body. Don't bend over to pick something up. Um, and, and, and in those ways, by following all the, the um, uh, all the kind of like, like the, the directives for proper modest conduct, it, end, it ends up, it, you know, if that's not something you actually want to do and want to subscribe to, it ends up being extremely limiting and controlling. It ends up being that you can't, you know, you can't study what you want and, and have friends with who you want and talk about what you want. Because, so, you know, so many topics are, you know, it's shameful for women to talk about them. You never, like, I grew up, the word sex was not never mentioned at home. Like, I never had any sex education and I, everything I learned was from books and the internet. Um, I, the, there was like no reasonable expectation of privacy because the whole um, patriarchal concept that, you know, I was supposed to be my father's daughter until I became my husband's wife and until, you know, you know my father kind of like handed me off to, to my husband. There was nothing that I was, uh, that, that I did or read or said that, that my parents didn't feel that they were privy to. Um, and so like it was the type of thing where like I grew up without privacy. I wasn't allowed to uh, close my room. I wasn't allowed to use the internet without supervision. I'm talking as an adult. I'm talking as, you know, a, a grad student. I'm talking about as like I would go to school and I would, um, and I would have like this position of, 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 you know, almost authority and respect where I'm standing in front of a classroom and teaching and then I come home and I can't do a single thing without the permission of my parents. Now, the reason that this, this was like the case had a lot to do with the jurisprudence itself, had a lot to do with the, the rules that were um, normalized, that were normative um, in our community, but it also had to do with, um, with, with just the way that the 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 that the kind of like the social institutions surrounding my existence were structured. 
Um, because if I had wanted to, say, not wear hijab, or if I had wanted to, uh, uh, y you know, to study something different, or if I had wanted to have friendships with, with men or boys, or if I had wanted to go places and do things, I wouldn't have been able to. I know because I tried, and it did not end well at all. Um, and it took me a while to kind of, um, to kind of really understand just how, ju just how involved all the mechanisms of constraint were. And, and, th and that's really what, what it comes down to. When we talk about whether or not you are free to engage in a bodily choice such as hijab, the problem isn't so much hijab and, and, the, uh, and the doctrine surrounding it. If that's something that someone really believes in and thinks that that's the best way for them to conduct themselves, that's fine, it's great, and, I, and everyone should be given the chance to do that. The problem was um, with, with how little effective choice there is surrounding it especially you know for for muslim women all over the world and it, and the thing is like like you know Rada mentioned that like you might think that oh you grew up in saudi arabia and it's different there and they're extremist blah 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 well set, well setting saudi arabia aside the funny thing is whenever people are talking about whether or not it is true that millions upon millions of women worldwide are constrained into modesty doctrines they tend to focus on really superficial like legal aspects. They go like, oh, well, the only countries where it's actually mandatory to cover your hair in public are sa or cover your body or and hair in public are Saudi Arabia and Iran. And that um, kind of like foregoes the, uh, it's just even the concept that there are other forms of institutional oppression. That the, the, along with the legal, there's the extrajudicial. There's there are all sorts of social mechanisms. Um, so growing up in the, in the Shia demographic in Lebanon, Lebanon happens to be a very, very sectarian country where we have something called personal status laws, such as the sect of your birth dictates exactly which laws apply to you when it comes to civil matters. So uh, who I could marry, um, of, of what sect, etc., cetera, um, and, and, and things like inheritance laws and stuff like that, all of that was basically dictated by my sect of birth. Um, and and Basically, I had different legal rights and privileges based on my sect of birth than a Sunni would, or, or than a Christian would, or than a Shia man would, or than a Christian woman would, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, basically, based on my gender and my sect of birth. Um, so, so there is that. There is that type of constraint. And there is also the constraint that you have in Lebanon, a situation where a, an Islamist militant group, Hezbollah, happens to be kind of like a three-in-one semi-state. Yeah, they have the militant section, but that's like you know almost no one's concerned about that um, inside the country. And then there's the fact that the schools and the and the and the clinics and the um, and just almost anything that you would want to get done socially when you belong to that community goes through Hezbollah. They have this power over you, such that, you know, even if my family had been accepting me, even if I had wanted to just move out of that community, live somewhere else in Lebanon, just live my life the way I want, I couldn't, and I know, because I tried. I tried to leave home when I was 18. We're legally, legally in Lebanon. I'm an adult. It doesn't matter because Hezbollah has extrajudicial power. They literally hunted me down and brought me home. And I was basically kept home for almost the entire entire next year. Uh, and there are other cases, you know, we, we hear the stories all around that, you know, in, uh, in a Shia village in the south, in south Lebanon or whatever, a girl seen walking down the street without her hijab at night, picked up and taken back to her father's house because we don't have girls who walk the streets at night. So there are extra ju judicial forces, there are legal forces, and there's all these social constraints. We lose everything when we step out. We um, often, our ability to go to school, to work, to get married, all, s all sorts of stuff like that hinges upon our compliance to the, to the basically the, the performative standards of our gender I in our communities. I and there are so many women who are stuck in, in insular communities where they may, not, may or may not really want to be doing all of these things, like these, these strenuous acts of worship, whether or not they actually believe in them, dress in a certain way, behave in a certain way, do certain things, but they know that they're not going to be able to get married. They know that there is going to be all this pressure on their family. There's this, like, there's this, uh, this concept of honor where like, our fa basically, your access to a good life hinges on your family's social standing, and your family's social standing hinges upon the conduct of its women. 
And so you're bearing all of the, you know, the burden of your brothers and your father, your uncles, and they all say, you know, you you would shame us. Um, and so like I wore the hijab for years when I was a closeted atheist. I frankly didn't believe in it, and I was just always hiding everything that I actually thought and felt. It felt like I was lying with every movement, like lying with what I was wearing, lying with with my actions, because I would like pray in front of them. I would pray even though I, I don't, I didn't believe in God. I, you know, fasting in Ramadan and it just like uh, avoiding all the questions about who I saw and what I did and, and what I ate and, and, and what I talked about at school that day, blah, blah, blah. Okay, sorry, I'm going <laughs> on too long. Uh, yeah, let's, let's, Make yeah, yeah, because you're, you're touching on a lot of topics. Can you hear me? This mic doesn't work, I feel like. The other one works. Yeah, but then it's just this passing back and forth. Um, yeah, Hippo was touching on a lot of topics that I wanted to get in depth with, uh, with the questions. Um, but I realized that I never actually introduced myself, but my, my name is Sarah. Um, I am a writer, I'm an activist, and I co-founded Ex-Muslims of North America a couple of years ago, and I've been working with them ever since. And just to keep my story short, it's not as exciting as theirs, but I was, I was born in Pakistan and I was raised in Texas. Um, and m my family is what I would consider uh, an, a, a l truly liberal um, from a Muslim perspective. So relative to, relative to Christians, it's, they're not, they weren't very, very liberal, but relative to other Muslim families, I think my family was, was quite lenient. Um, I was never forced into wearing the hijab. Um, although there was a variety of ways in which, you know, modesty is in, as, as a whole was enforced. But I would say that, that my family was, 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 relatively, was relatively liberal and relatively lenient. Um, I left the faith when I was um, 16 or 15, but I was quite young when I, when I decided that, you know, I just didn't, it just didn't make a lot of sense to me. And, um, you know, I just didn't feel like God or the idea of, of this, this, this this morality uh, made a lot of sense, so I left the I left the faith, um, and I found that I was quite alone when I did. I didn't know many other people like myself. Um, we might touch on this, but we might not. But it's uh, within within Muslim communities, which are which are which are quite you know quite quite uh, close knit. Uh, it can be difficult for people who leave the faith to find others uh, like us because you just don't want to open up and talk about this because there's such a stigma uh, to apostasy as a whole. So um, I didn't know, didn't know any 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 ex-Muslims, uh, and I just didn't really want to have that conversation. I kind of hid my my apostasy uh, with f from my family and my friends. Um, but uh, after after graduating, um, I I co-founded Ex Muslims of North America um, because I found that there was that w that when I first did meet my ex the, the the first ex Muslim like out in the wild, it was just such a it was such a validating experience. You know, it made me feel like okay, I'm I'm not that crazy, I'm not that weird, um, that this is that this is rational, you know, and this is okay, and it's okay to be like this. And it was just it was such a it was such a uplifting experience and we started to have these 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 um, events uh, private events for ex-muslims only and we, we had all these security uh, measures to make sure that you know we kind of knew the person before they were allowed in into the events and they were not publicly posted or in any kind of um, location that might that might uh, put us in danger um, and so we started holding these uh, these events and we found that people were driving from you know, like eight hours away, one way, just to come to a two hour, like uh, happy hour, essentially. And, you know, there would be people who would just break down in tears every time uh, that because, of some, because of some conversation they'd be having with another person that really resonated with them and reminded them of, of, of some of the things that they had been, that they had went through. So we realized that, oh, this is something, this is, this is a need that needs to be filled some way. And so uh, we, uh, we, we started Ex Muslim North America. We started fostering these communities, these local uh, communities all across the United States and Canada. And now we have like, I think, what, 18, some, something like that, like uh, quite a few um, all across the United States and Canada. And we're, we're really proud of that. And we're hoping to give ex-Muslims who are often, you know, that we're often in the closet. And we borrow a lot of language from like the gay rights movement, but we, we use the terms in the closet to mean that we're not open with our family and friends about our lack of faith because you don't want to face uh, what comes after. 
So due to that, there's a sense of isolation, and we were hoping that our communities can resolve some of those issues, can give a little bit of comfort to people who are otherwise just in very tricky situations where you you have to pick of what whether you want to be true to your conscience or whether you want your family and friends in your life supporting you and if you want that community. So. Uh, we were hoping to give them a little bit of leeway, a little bit of comfort uh, in this scenario and hopefully to empower them because they knew they had us, they knew they had a community, empower them to speak out so that they didn't, they wouldn't lose everything if they did decide to speak out. Their family might not talk to them, their former Muslim community might, might refuse to contact them anymore, but they might, they might know a few people through our communities who, who would have their back and support them. Um, one of the things that we've encountered since we've been um, talking about um, ex-Muslims and trying to educate the public and, and Muslim communities about, about this issue is that the political climate has, has really made this a very difficult uh, position to hold. And I'm sure many of the people in this room are aware, but this is a very like politically hostile climate, um, especially when you want to have an honest and nuanced conversation about practically anything, but in particular about Islam and about women's rights in in, in particular to Islam. Um, and I found that there's just this uh, this dichotomy where it's a lose-lose situation on both the political left and the political right, where on on the le on the on the right there's a sense that okay, well we need to combat Islam and this threat of Islam, and there's no thought put into uh, Muslims as a people and having compassion for them as a people and for standing up for their civil liberties. There's a sense that we will we need to do anything that we can do to combat this threat. And if that means that uh, you know some Muslims get their civil liberties taken away, well, that then then that's a price we're okay with paying. And of course, this is something that is you know seems disgusting to me um, as somebody who has Muslim family uh, members and friends that who I love and care deeply for. I certainly wouldn't want them to to uh, lose any of their rights as citizens uh, in this country. So uh, th that, that part of the political aisle, I feel like is just, it, it, there's just a lot of toxic um, concepts which, which we just need to just shed as we move forward. And then with the political left, there's a sense that, well, we need to do, we need to protect Muslims from anti-Muslim bigotry. We need to do what we can to protect them. And that, if that means that we have to just look the other way, um, when it comes to certain issues, and that's what we'll do. Um, sometimes it gets to be a little bit more perverse, and I've seen this especially when it comes to women's rights and to the hijab uh, in particular, where there's a sense of, well, uh, all that matters is that it's a woman's choice, and then there's many hijabis who, for them, it was a choice, and then they're very public and they're very outspoken uh, about the fact that it was a choice for them, and the conversation kind of just ends there. But of course, that's not the whole story because there are many, many, you know, hundreds of millions of women across the world uh, in Muslim communities who don't really have much of a choice. Um, could you say the, the 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 analog, I guess, that I use for this is: Would you would you have said uh, that an American woman in in the 1950s was as free to um, to work outside of the home and just be a single mother um, as she was to be a homemaker. And you would have, of course, women in the 50s would say, well, it's my choice to be a homemaker. I want to, I want to raise children. I want to be a mother. And this is the role that's, that fits me. But of course, that it, might, it might very well be the choice that she would have made anyway. But in that atmosphere, could you have known, would you, would you say that that atmosphere was truly one where free choices are easy to make? Um, so. This is a, uh, obviously a difficult climate, and one of the things that we wanted to address with this tour is to bring ex-Muslims, people who have something to lose with, with, with sort of both sides of these extremes. Um, we wanted to shed light on some of these issues, um, talk about uh, trying to get into the nitty-gritty of the ways that this affects uh, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. And so to start off, um, I think we covered hijab quite a bit, but we'll C let's Can I piggyback off something you said? Is sure. this working? I can't tell. No? Yeah. Yes? No. No. Yeah. No, you have no. to do this one. Right. Um, so, so uh, uh, part of the huge struggle of trying to, to, to bridge that gap or, or, or have the kind of like middle course between the bigotries of, of, the, of the left and the bigotries of the right is that essentially we're not talking about this because we want to tear down Islam or Muslims. We're talking about this because we 
actually care about the rights and freedoms of people, and especially women, in insular religious communities. Um, and, and, and the thing is, the thing that gets me is that when, when we get this, this kind of like response from the left that like, oh, but y you know, y you know, they're talking about in, in quasi defensive hijabis. Um, and the thing is, it's just like, you know what, you're, you are not going to be more concerned about this than, than I am about my, my hijabi mother and my hijabi sister. And, and, and I personally know what it's like to be discriminated against and stigmatized because of the hijab. I'm the one who walked around wearing hijab for 15 years. Um, and, and, and there's this, and the, the funny thing is, is that like, you know, if you care about a hijabi who gets um, verbally assaulted on public transportation, you should also care about the hijabi who gets beaten by her father because she got caught texting a boy in class. And if you only care about one and not the other, and, and, and not just that, you, if you deny that the second one happens and just uh, and, uh, talk about it as if it's some kind of racist myth, as if we don't have the same kind of like structures of, of conservativism and patriarchy as almost every other society on this planet, uh, then, uh, I mean, it, it's just... Uh, it, it, then you care more about, uh, I guess, being performative about being progressive than you do about what's actually going on with these women, especially when you are constantly orienting yourselves towards, and I mean, forgive me for this, but it's the truth, towards the women who have the most privilege and platform and voice, the ones who are uh, the, the kind of like proud, free-speaking, open hijabis who consistently talk about how it's it's not it's something that's not that they're not coerced into and blah blah blah. The thing about that is that of course you're only and ever going to be hearing from the voices that are already approved of and celebrated and uplifted from within their own cultural zeitgeist, from within their own cultural community. That's why these are the voices on the front line of 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 just talking about Muslim issues. The girls who, and the girls and the women who are suffering under purity norms and patriarchal norms, they don't have the platform and the capacity to say, this isn't my choice, and I am not, uh, and I'm being constrained into these things. Because of, uh, as a function of their very constraint, as a function of everything they stand to lose because of that visibility. So we're already invisible, and then this kind of like well-meaning attempt to um, what's the word, uh, sanitize everything involving the potential oppression of women in the Muslim world. And let's be real, women are oppressed all over the globe. It's not something specific to Muslim communities, but there are particular ways in which it manifests in the Muslim world. And we can't remedy those aspects unless we talk about them. Can I just want to say one more thing? Um, so Hiba mentioned something about um, denying that you know the woman that gets beat up because her father caught her texting a boy it's not just the denying part it's the part where for example when i go and speak to somebody who's like yeah but that's not the story for every muslim woman or every ex-muslim woman. it's like i know that i know i come from an extreme background my parents were extreme and i understand that but i also knew a lot of others from non-extreme backgrounds that went through something very similar where even though she didn't wear hijab and she was able to travel and whatnot, when story was broken or rumors got out that you know she was dating a boy, she was put back home, she was beaten, and a few months later, yeah. And she was beaten and then she was put back home and we never heard from her again. And that person was my cousin. And another, and another, uh, my cousin, another person was a friend of mine and another person was somebody that I just heard of. These people exist in our communities and when somebody is told, it's like, yeah, yeah, but that's just, you know, an outlier. That just, you know, happens to one in a million. It's like, no, it doesn't. This happens in almost every household, even households that are liberal in the Muslim sense. It happens. The purity culture is very serious. Well, I guess I'll, I'll I, I wanted to, to ask a, a different question, but this is just where the conversation is flowing. So we'll just go with it. Um, to add to what, what Gada said, it's not so much that that because I, I did grow up in a liberal background I wasn't I didn't have super coercive parents and you know now I still have contact with them and they're 
weirdly proud of me. I mean, it's just, it's a strange thing. It was on the one hand, they're very ashamed, and on the other hand, they're kind of like, oh, well, she's making a name for herself, so I guess that's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, it's just, it's, I know that they're in a really tough spot, and I feel for them. Um, but to, to the point that it's a culture. So it's not that every person has to be super oppressed or every person has to feel disempowered every day because of uh, the, the, the requirements of the religion. It may be the case that some are truly empowered, some feel that this, is, this uplifts them um, and uh, that it honors them as women. Uh, but the fact is that, that there is a wider culture um, that just has a push effect that creates Ex that fosters extremist situations like what what these two two ladies suffer. That it, they, it just doesn't. It's not a just a random outlier that can happen anywhere and can happen to any communities. Um, communities foster uh, that sort of thing. You know, it it's, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't just come up randomly. So I think that the broader um, the broader ideas behind modesty culture need to be addressed. So even if we're not talking about specifically the hijab, we can talk about what does it mean when a woman's worth is tied down to how sexual she is? Uh, what does it mean when, you know, the, the idea that, the, that a woman being covered or not covered um, is tied to how responsible she might be for sexual assault, right? I mean, these are, these are concepts that are inherently backwards. They're concepts that are, that are anti-woman, they shouldn't be concepts that we should be celebrating just under the guise of, of you know, diversity. Because like, like, like these two so eloquently stated, it is something that affects Muslim communities, it affects Muslim women, as well as ex-Muslims uh, and people on the outside. But let me uh, pose some, some, some questions to you guys uh, about this. Um, generally speaking, uh, how would you say that uh, the religion as you experienced it was was gendered, and I know you touched on this a little bit that there are different impositions uh, on on men wor versus women. Um, but what I'm interested in is how how that w what that does to the climate as a whole, um, specifically how that affects the way that the sexes interact with each other. Because I found that it creates this really toxic climate. Um, it's uh, with the way that men relate to women and women relate to men because there's this idea that women are temptresses. <laughs> so, so you relate, as men, you have to relate to them a little bit differently because they might lead you astray and, uh, and, and vice versa. So I think that it creates, it, it, it's, it creates this, this situation where men and women inherently are going to mistrust each other to a certain degree or, or, or to feel as if they sh there should be a distance. So when we're talking about men and women understanding each other and moving forward to a more egalitarian society, step one has to be that we're willing to talk to each other. You know, we're willing to, to, to have these conversations. So I was just wondering about, about your perspectives on, on that issue. So in my experience, and mainly because I came from a very segregated society in Saudi Arabia, it really does make a lot of women and a lot of men incapable of interacting with the opposite sex. They have no way of knowing what their intentions are. I mean, as an example, one of my friends, when she began working with me, and it was an unsegregated society, she thought that any man that was talking to her was hitting on her. And like, maybe he's not hitting on you, but you never know. I mean, maybe he was because he himself grew up in a segregated society, and maybe she was one of the very few women that he gets to interact with on a daily basis. And it's not just that, it's also the, the concept of uh, women are responsible because you know, if you're not wearing modest clothing, if you're not wearing the hijab, if something happens to you, like you get sexually assaulted or you know, somebody cat calls you or God forbid you get even raped, then it's your fault. It's one of the things that you know, we hear here, especially in universities, and I, and I remember in, um, when they do the orientation, they give you um, some of the talks and one of the things that you know you hear is that sometimes when a woman goes to an officer or and I'm, I'm not trying to like put anybody on in, under the spotlight or anything like that, but I mean sometimes if you go some to somebody and tell them like you know you were raped or you were sexually assaulted, one of the first things that they do is you, they look at you. What are you wearing? And they ask you, what were you wearing? What were you doing? Who were you talking to? And I had that experience with somebody that I, I dated for a while. And um, when I told him that, you know, a story that I read somewhere where a girl was out with her male friends and she was raped by all of them. 
I was like, well, she should have known better. In, the mo in modesty culture, in, in the cultures that we grew up in, if a girl goes out not wearing a hijab and she gets sexually assaulted, she's automatically blamed. Why was she out is number one. Why was she not wearing hijab? Or maybe her hijab was not worn the right way. And he thought, oh, well, and that's not, and that's not only that, especially in, in cultures in, in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, where they grow up thinking that you know, men can do no wrong. We have a saying in Arabic, I don't know how to say that in, in English. Uh, it's like, um, you know, there's no shame in, for men. Like, there's no way to know if a man was assaulted or if he strayed. Whereas a woman, it's, you know, she's not a virgin, she's not a virgin. <laughs> It's the same thing, it's, it's, it's that. So, you know, men are pretty much blameless and they also grow up with that notion. And so whenever uh, they, they also, what's the word that I'm looking for? Make excuses for themselves, defend themselves even saying, well, she was wearing a short skirt or I could see her hair. I mean, she was asking for it. She was out, she looked at me, she smiled at me. No, she was not. And when you, uh, and, and that's one of the things, if you grow up in a culture like that, when you teach your girls that you know, they're responsible for uh, the way they dress and for what happens to them if they dress in a certain way, and you tell boys, you know what, you know, you're, you're blameless, you can do whatever you want, because you know, we, the gendered norm in the, way, in the way they raise these children is that they raise women to be pure, to be, poised to be, you know, pretty much clueless and they have to be uh, wrapped and, what is it? Unequal. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Unequal to their male counterparts, where males, you know, they can do whatever they want, you know, boys will be boys, this sort of thing. But it goes a notch up more than that in cultures that we grow up in. Um. So to, to piggyback off the whole um, purity culture slash rape culture thing, there's this, um, there's this really interesting kind of like flip side that I see. Um, it's kind of like two sides of the same coin. We talk a lot here um, in, in academia and uh, third wave feminism, in liberal circles about uh, how a lot of the US, we call it a rape culture. That, um, and, and by this we mean a lot of the things that you were just talking about, how uh, you know, women are scrutinized and, and, and judged and basically dressed up and down according to their conduct um, just in order to, uh, to, and they're basically not, not able to defend themselves against, against the idea that they're not responsible for uh, being assaulted and basically being, being <coughs> oppressed. Um, and, and just the very idea that like if you wear revealing clothing then you're basically inviting objectification and it's somehow your fault if someone decides to do something to you. Um, so growing up, it was very, very similar to that. And, and the kind of like funny slash ironic thing about it is that um, in, the, in the sect that I grew up in, and this is also generally a mainstream thing, and I'm, I'm kind of like giving this caveat because I know that there are other interpretations of hijab that don't hinge, hinge upon this, um, this conception of sexual purity. I know that a lot of uh, women choose to wear it as a marker of faith and, and not for these reasons and so on. I'm, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about what's still predominant and what's still normative and what's still largely enforced, both you know, socially and, and legally and extrajudiciously. Um, so, before I started wearing hijab, like, you know, when my parents were teaching me about it and, and trying to get me to, to like it, it wasn't just that they wanted me to wear hijab, they wanted me to love it. Um, so they, they would give these analogies, the, these analogies that were basically at core objectifying, which is really ironic because so much of the rhetoric surrounding um, defense of the hijab as, as a good thing for women to engage in talks about how it allows you to stave off sexual objectification, how it allows you to be first and foremost viewed as a person, as an agent, and not as a sexual object for the consumption of others. Because you know, you're covering everything and so you're basically forcing the society to respect you and, and so on. The funny thing is that, you know, my parents were teaching me that, you know, a girl without her hijab is like, a piece of candy with a wrapper off of it. And, and you know, it's gonna get dirty and all the bugs are, are gonna 
crawl on it, and, and if someone's already put it in their mouth, then it becomes useless and worthless. Or it's like, a, it's like a, a, a pearl without the shell around it or something like that. Basically, literally comparing girls and women to objects, like actual objects, not just objects, but objects to be consumed. Um, instead of looking at us as people, first and foremost, like our bodies were the most important thing about us. Um, and so there was this, and then there was this idea that like, no, okay, so now you're getting to this age and you have to start covering up. And it does this thing where it not only desexualizes you like as an agent, like of course we weren't ever allowed to date, or let alone, you know, let alone friends with people of the opposite sex, let alone like date or, or, or have any type of extramarital relationship. Um, there are these like norms that uh, both have, they're both rooted in the jurisprudence and in the social stuff that have to do with like, no, you can't even shake hands with members of the opposite sex. Um, you have to kind of like, um, it, it, you know, just put your hand here. You never touch someone of the opposite sex. When you're talking to some members of the opposite sex, sex you're just, you have to look down and not actually look at them. It's called lowering your gaze. There's a saying that like, if a man and a woman are in a room by themselves, the devil is the third. So basically the idea that men and women cannot have any basic interactions that are not imbued with some kind of sexual dimension that has to, and that's the thing that you have to, um, that you have to guard against. Um, and so I felt desexualized as an agent, but also hypersexualized as an object. Because here I am, eight years old, and I'm suddenly told that my hair, my hair, my arms, my limbs are sexual temptations are fitna. The, the, the word fitna literally means sedition and discord, and that is a word that's, that's used to describe women's bodies when they're uncovered. Or aura. Aura is the word that we use to describe the, 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 um, the body parts that need to be covered up in terms of the, the modesty um, requirements. The aura areas are different for men and women, but aura, the Arabic word, comes from the, the word for disfigurement, like like all of these, these, these negative stigma and, be, and the idea that like I, as a prepubescent child, I had to cover my hair and my arms and my legs so as not to tempt the boys and men around me. First of all, that is kind of, it, it's incredibly demeaning and dehumanizing and it, it's, it's the opposite of staving off objectification. It makes it so that if a bit of your hair or a sliver of your wrist or part of your ankle shows, then suddenly you're a slut. And suddenly you're, you're, inviting, uh, you're inviting unsavory attention from the opposite sex and it's your fault. And there's a reason that so the countries with, the, with the, um, the most predominant norms in terms of women covering up have some of the highest sexual assault rates in the world. It's an absolute myth that covering your body actually staves off sexual objectification and assault. And so it was like I, I was depersonalized over and over again. And it had everything to do with the w just, just my gender and my body. And it, ha and it basically affected every single interaction. There was n no way I could interact with a member of the opposite sex that wasn't somehow already suspect. Like I couldn't call a friend over homework. I couldn't, uh, you know, the, just the very concept that you might want to sit down and have a conversation about just anything random, mm -hmm. things that just people like to talk about with some of the, no, every single time like, there's even suspicion you're talking to a boy, who is he? What are you trying to do? Blah, 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 blah. And, and it's just, like, it's just the, the very idea that it's, that there is nothing more important to your purpose as a woman than to guard your sexual purity. To the extent that like the, the thing I, I talked about where I, I tried to run away from home was at 18, I was still wearing hijab when I left. I, uh, I w didn't like do anything. And I just wanted to leave because I frankly came from a violent, oppressive household and I couldn't freaking breathe. Um, but when I came home, one of the first things my parents did was just endlessly interrogate me because they couldn't, they couldn't process the concept of me wanting to be on my own and have agency as a person in the world unless it had something to do with me being deviant going astray. So my, my father's first two questions is, did you leave to become a prostitute or because you're pregnant? 
And then, and then, and then they took me to a gynecologist's office in Dahia, which is like the Hezbollah-controlled region of South Beirut, um, so that she could perform a virginity test on me, which is illegal um, and which is a form of sexual assault. And uh, you know, ironic thing, you're so concerned about my sexual purity, they subject me to sexual assault. Um, but it didn't matter because because it was viewed as the most, the only and the most important thing. That was the first thing they thought about. The first thing their minds went to, and the first thing they wanted to make sure. And after the gynecologist somehow confirmed that I uh, was indeed a virgin, like, you know, not that it's, you can actually confirm that, the relief that my parents felt, it would be like you had told them I'd been cured of cancer or something. Like, like it was just like, they were just like, oh, thank Jesus. Okay, not thank Jesus, but you know. <laughs> All right, I always talk too much, so. <laughs> well, um, so let's see, I want to, I want to get to the, the q and I always enjoy that aspect of it most in any of these talks. So I, I want to know what you guys think and what your questions might be. Um, so just as a final, um, as a final question, uh, I wanted to touch on a little bit uh, about the relationship between Western feminism and uh, and and Islam and women's rights because uh, I think a lot of people have noticed uh, that there is a little bit of silence um, in f with f coming from modern day feminists when it comes to the hijab when it comes to misogyny when it comes from Islamic sources um, and there seems to be a double standard and a lot of people have noticed it and especially um, far right people have noticed it and they've capitalized on it and they've used it as a as as a way to say see they they uh, the, these feminists there there aren't truly feminist all along they don't really care about women's rights because if they did then they would care about the women's rights of 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 muslim women um so unfortunately it's become this this really toxic uh, this really toxic atmosphere and i wanted to to know about your thoughts um where you think uh, what Western feminism has failed and how you think it can improve, um, briefly if possible, because I, I do want to get to the Q&A. Quick question, Western feminism as opposed to what kind of feminism? Well, um, I, I would say feminism as practiced in the West. I don't mean feminism as, an, as the ideal, which is to say that all w you know, women's rights are, are, are human rights, women deserve equality. Not, not, the f not the ideal, but as it is practiced uh, by women in the West. Let's just say third wave slash intersectional feminism. Oof, I think that's, that's a good in okay. encapsulation. <laughs> okay. um, for me, I, mean, I grew up and my father, I was very lucky that what my father really believed in you know, women's education and women's um, uh, right to work and the like, and mainly because he didn't trust men back home. And he thought that all men were uh, not to be trusted and he wanted me to be set for life so he pushed the education and he pushed uh, me to uh, always be successful at work and even though um, and I did not mention this before but uh, I escaped Saudi Arabia I, I I left in the middle of the night one day and just got on a plane and came here uh, I did get a lot of threats from my family uh, my father was not very happy but he was never unhappy because I was an atheist he was unhappy that I was you know, uncovered and people, and he thought people were using me and nobody was using me, dad. But, um, so what, um, back to your um, question about feminism. So my father was the first person that I met who, would I, who I would call a feminist. Maybe not today, but back then, when he was pushing me towards, you know, he would, he would always give me books to learn and he never thought, he never treated me differently than he did my brothers. For example, if I cried, he would he would yell at me and tell me, you know, you're a, you're a grown woman, you're not supposed to cry. And he would say the same thing to my my brothers, but you know, you're grown men, you're not supposed to cry. He treated me the same way he treated them. Uh, and uh, so that's how I view f how I viewed femi feminism as I was growing up. That it's equality between the two sexes at any point, including you know, working. And he you know when, when in Saudi Arabia you need a legal guardian to go to school, to work, to pretty much to do anything. And my father would always like scoff and laugh at that because he thought it was ridiculous. And he thought that this is one of the things that women should always be fighting for. And he was very glad that feminism still existed in Saudi Arabia for that reason. And I've always thought that this is what 
modern day or Western feminism was like until I came to the United States a few years ago when I escaped. And I realized that feminism was botched or somebody stole it and turned it into this hate group of some sort in which it's either anti-men or anti-certain types of men and it's become very toxic. And that's not the feminism that I look at. I, I, I look at feminism as Hiba mentioned, the intersectional feminism, the feminism of, of the 60s and the 70s that introduced women, that, that, that got women out in about in like the sexual revolution, women going into the workplace, you know, women uh, demanding equal pay, demanding equal rights, demanding equal presence. And it's, it's funny that now that this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to demand equal opportunities as ex-Muslims. And yet these feminists look at us as hate, the hateful people that want to destroy Islam and destroy Muslim people, especially Muslim women. I don't want to destroy Muslim women. And I'm pretty sure n none of us do. I mean, Hiba has family that is hijabi. I have family that are hijabi. I don't want to go and take off their hijab. I want them to make that choice on their own. If they want to wear it, then by all means, this is how you uh, show your faith. But I don't want to wear it, and I don't want you to force me to wear it. I don't want you to tell me that I have to wear it, and I don't want you to, to look at me differently because I don't wear it. Why can't I be respected the same way you are respected? By, giving your, by, by looking at yourself like you're better than me because you wear the hijab, then it, that means that I'm lacking something. And another thing that, um, that bothers me about this, that modern day feminism are always against this purity culture, and they always talk about rape culture. And yet they, um, at the same time, promote hijab and promote hijabi women that talk, and, and I'm not talking about all hijabi women, I'm talking specifically about the women that always talk about, you know, this is how I dress and I love modesty. I like, but isn't modesty the complete opposite of, of what you're trying to, to eliminate or trying to fight? Okay. Um. Yeah, this, is, this, is, this is an involved question, I'll try not to. Okay, so um, I, I, I think I differ in, uh, on certain aspects. Um, for one, I think, that, uh, I think that there is a lot that is going on that is very, very good when it comes to the way that feminism is um, refined and practiced today. Um, I also think that in its very attempts to be more progressive, it ends up falling into some very terrible and dangerous flaws. Um, so, um, so when we've been, there's this, this kind of like recently in the past like 15, 20 years or so, this kind of re revival um, of the concept of feminism is not just having to do with, with certain standards of equality, like whether or not women can work or be single mothers or blah, 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 but the idea that like, look, Women come from very, very varied groups, and a lot of the time their oppression hinges on things that have to do with more than their status as women. We wanna talk about how being queer intersects with being a woman, or how being of color intersects with being a woman, or how being um, uh, of, you know, disabled or economically underprivileged or so on. The idea that the way in which women are empowered in the world definitely hinges upon the intersections of certain identities. So there's all these focuses on, the, on their identities. And yeah, it's true that in many, many ways, a woman from a Muslim background has it harder here in the US or in the West or whatever than a white woman. Um, and, and it's really hard to, to parse the distinctions and so on. And, and so there's that, there, there's the, the kind of like the, the, this, this, this tendency to want to move away from a unilateral idea of what women want and need, which is good. But then that falls into what we call choice feminism. The idea that feminism is about uplifting the individual choices of women rather than tearing down um, the institutions that restrict and constrain women from having certain choices. There's the idea that there has been so much focus on uh, frankly privileged women, white women, middle class women, blah, 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 and, and their empowerment, and now we have to move on. And we have to start listening to minorities, and we have to start seeing the ways in which they're, they're impacted in, 
it just it, in various contexts, and we need to and we need to 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 involve our activism in that way. You know, the the kind of like um, soundbite that like my feminism is going to be intersectional or it's going to be bullshit. And in an attempt to do that, there's this this, um, this very conscious anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist um, sensibility that's coming out. That like, look, we know that anti-Muslim bigotry is a very real and oppressive force in this world. We also know that um, we Westerners have had this tradition of imposing our views and our way of life on people, especially people from the third world, especially immigrants and so on, and we need to step back and we need to start listening to the women from these backgrounds and taking into consideration what they have to say. And we can't just sit there and, and, and impose things on them. The problem is, and there's a, you know, the concept of positionality, that you have to be conscious of your position, of, 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 of how you might have blind spots due to, due to your privilege, due to the way you're situated, where you just don't have access to the same information and experience as other people. You have to step back and you have to give the platform to other people. I think that's largely what's behind the, uh, you know, what goes on where you end up having, ironically, the most um, privileged and voiced women who end up endorsing conser conservative values um, and, and a certain way of life is, is their choice being upheld by leftists, by liberals, by feminists, um, to the exclusion of any um, uh, competing narrative. And in here, in the, there, in, and I think this has to do with, with issues that, that go into the theoretical failings of models like positionality and intersectionality to begin with. So the idea of positionality, um, you're like, well, I, Clearly, so, uh, you know, a, a very a conscientious, progressive, um, white feminist woman might be like, I am not in a position to give, pass judgment on how Muslim women live their lives and, and how they, they want to conduct themselves and their families and their communities and so on. I need to step back and listen because their positionality is, is just basically has priority that over mine in this issue. The problem with that is that you can, you just keep t picking apart, picking apart when it comes to positionality because you're never going to be able to tell if the person you're talking to is an adequate representative of the community that they say that they are a repre representative. It, it, it's, it's, an, it's an attempt to homogenize in the very attempt, in, in, in the very process of diversifying and differentiating. And then who ends up getting um, kind of like, uh, their issues getting smoothed over and thrown under the rug and denied and blah, blah, blah. Like th there was that, that example of, uh, I forgot what UK university, there was a feminist slash LGBT group that was hosting an event and someone asked them to um, condemn FGM, female genital mutilation. And they're like, and they kind of gave a pause and they're like, well, I can't condemn female genital mutilation because my colonial is past. The idea that because of your position, you are, unable to apply the same standards of critique, the same standards of critique that should be objective, um, even if you don't have access to the full information and so on. And, and the funny thing is, is that so much of the apologism that comes out of the mouths of the people who are given platforms um, by intersectional feminists today is the same, it follows the same exact structure as the apologism of conservative Christians or, or you know, or, or insular communities with different types of purity culture that, that, that have this, you know, that fall into the same exact fallacies that are considered unacceptable, that are considered uh, just, uh, you, you know, toxic and, and insidious and oppressive by the same people who kind of like aren't able to, to, to provide the same, the same standards of critique. So to give, give an example, the FGM example, there was a, an article by an anthropologist, I think it was in the Atlantic um, a few years ago, about how she went to a certain village in Africa and spent time with some of the women there and how they were like furiously defending um, the fact that they, they underwent um, uh, genital cutting before their weddings and, and they had the, and, and, and she came away like blown away by the idea that like, oh, this practice has cultural significance and personal meaning and they cleave to it strongly. Well, you could say that about almost any toxic and impressive norm in the West that feminists tend to speak about. You can say that about like, uh, gosh, it, it, beauty norms or whatever. 
like the whole the, w the way that women are expected to you know the heels and the makeup and blah blah blah, blah and, and their worth is reduced to their appearance you can have a woman who uh, you know the idea that women are the ones that socialize each other into it the idea that there are lots of women who like and cleave to and strongly defend their choices when it comes to that and the idea that they these still pose oppressive institutions that need to be dismantled when it comes to just how women are able to conduct and comport themselves in, in their lives, if they deviate from those standards, all of those points are consistent. Um, and, and, but somehow the same standards of critique aren't applied. People will go like, well, the women say they want it, and it's the women that socialize w other women into it. It's not that like it's men forcing them into doing it. It's like a sisterhood thing. Or, and it's just like, you are so uh, concerned with not overstepping that you are overstepping because you end up elevating and celebrating the voices that obscure and uh, and 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 um, what's the word so it kind of marginalize the most silenced invisible and oppressed people from within Muslim communities or ex community of color or whatever Okay, well, I think that uh, that should be the last word on it. Um, but uh, what I don't know how, how we want to go about doing the question and answer uh, yeah. session. I, it, are, do people have, have questions or, or, yes. or is that? Okay, yeah. Um, well, we only have one working mic. So we, so we can hear people's voices, so just they'll shut them out and please repeat the question into the microphone. Okay, that makes sense. Very reasonable. Um, the guy in the middle was the first person right there. Okay. Okay, sure. Uh, so you talked a lot about how Islam sees men and women a little differently. Um, so I was wondering if there's a gender disparity in terms of uh, people joining ex-Muslims, if it's more women or men, or if it's fairly balanced. Oh yeah, yeah, sure, I can answer that. Um, so the gentleman was wondering if there was a gender disparity um, with people joining um, ex-Muslim North America. I'm assuming you're specifically referring to our organization. Um, a little bit, uh, but it's 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 something like uh, sixty forty. Uh, last I last I checked, so it's it's it, it it exists, but it's not as severe as I would have thought. And I have also found uh, that m women, well, ex-Muslim women in particular, are more outspoken. Uh, they are they're they're loud, and there there's a sense of like outrage, and um, and because they often have. Uh, it, it's more difficult for ex-Muslim women to remain in the closet uh, and live the lives the way that they want. Um, I found that they're more likely to be open. Uh, they're more likely to say, you know, I'm an ex-Muslim and then just to suffer the consequences as it comes because uh, as, a, as a Muslim man, you might have a little bit more freedoms. You can marry outside of the religion, for example, if you're a man. So there's certain uh, freedoms that men have. So, so some ex-Muslim men say, well, you know, I can just pretend and, and live this life and it's acceptable. And I think with women, that's just a, that's just an easier choice to make in, in, in some ways because women can just say, well, I can't put up with this life at all. So you're sort of forced into just being open and, and, and leaving behind those communities. But that was a good question. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, I'm interested um, about your relationship with your families today because you did say that you left in the middle of the night and you said that you had like a very aggressive family and I wonder if they know if you're atheist today and how they perceive that. Can I answer that? So um, as I said my family are very devout and it's um, one of the things that Hiba also touched on it's a sense of community like the whole family has to look the same. The whole family has to look uh, pretty much similar, like copy-paste from each other. If anybody is different, then e they're either oppressed or like what they did with me, disowned, publicly disowned. So when I left in the middle of the night and then my, my parents um, hacked into my email, found out that I was an atheist, uh, downloaded a lot of pictures from uh, my Google account and saved them as evidence of my um, straying or descent or whatever you want to call it, uh, then they trusted the wrong types of people who told other people and then everybody found out that I was an atheist. I got a lot of threats. Uh, they publicly disowned me. 
my mother still does not talk to me. If, if anything, my mother has said the worst things anyone has ever said to me from the people that I have, uh, that have tried to contact me. Um, my father is more, just wants to make sure that I'm alive, that I don't need anything kind of guy. I have three siblings. My brothers still talk to me. They don't really care much about religion, but they're not atheists. Um, other than that, because my family really cares about their public image, they try their best to make sure that no one tries to contact me. And this has happened when a cousin of mine that I am friends with uh, uh, contacted me and we became friends. But a picture of us started circling around in the community. And he got into a lot of trouble and, he had, and we had to come up with this elaborate lie in which I apologized profusely for, to him for trying to, to lead him astray and him um, like mouthing off at me or something like that so he can show his parents that look, I have nothing to do with her anymore. And uh, recently a, a younger cousin of mine, 17 years old, is pretty much risking his freedom trying to contact me because he was going through, he's going through now what I went through when I was his age. So uh, to, just to give a short answer, I don't have a relationship with my family other than my two youngest brothers and a few cousins that try their best to hide it from the family. Uh, it, it's kind of mixed for me. It's been five years since I left. Um, I left in a way such that I, I, well, the only way I could leave was that if I knew that I would be okay if I was cut off from everything. So I came to the US, um, graduate program and you know I had a p teaching position etc. I was financially independent um, and I didn't of course I, I didn't tell my parents that I was an apostate and I was coming to the US because I could live there in a way that I couldn't back home and so it kind of like came a, a huge shock to them um, and at first I tried to hide it I was like you know what I'm here they're all the way across the world in Lebanon I can just do what I want here and I don't need to kind of like fuss about it and it's just easier for it wasn't easier because they were still you know my father also hacked into my email telecom engineer um, and <laughs> and it was just the kind of thing where like my, my mother made sure I had a, a landline at home would call me every night to make sure I wasn't off gallivanting anywhere um, it was the type of thing where they were like it was just obsessive if it, policing and the control even though they they had much uh, much smaller ability to do it from from across the country, it w it, across the world. It was still so suffocating. Like every single time I wanted to go to a restaurant that wasn't halal or heaven forbid a bar or whatever, I would withdraw cash because my father kind of like looked at all my bank statements and saw he had access to my account. Just things like that. And after after a few months, I, and I also have um, family in the Arab uh, American immigrant community up in Dearborn, Michigan. Michigan, as my grandparents were Civil War refugees, um, and the idea was that I would be expected to go there and spend the whole time with my family during breaks. And so Christmas break was coming around from my first year in the U.S. and I was just and I was just like I cannot do it. I cannot put my hijab back on and go up and pretend to be a good Muslim girl every moment of every day for uh, I can't do it. So I came out to my mom. I told her, and she was heartbroken, blah, blah, blah. My father disowned me completely, it's mutual. Um, his entire <laughs> side of the family, none of them speak to me, which is good, uh, horrible people. Uh, my mom, over the years, we've slowly begun to be able to have a relationship again, but mostly hinges on us never talking about the things that we disagree about. Um, and just kind of like, you don't ask, don't tell, just, uh, and that's kind of it. it. I'm not really part of the family anymore. It's phone calls here and there. Sometimes I go up and visit my family when my mom visits her folks up in Michigan. And for a couple of days at the time, during the entire time, I'm just trying to keep the peace. And so I just don't say anything. I don't talk about my beliefs. I dress as conservatively as possible without putting a scarf on my head because I'm not willing to make that concession. And, uh, and that's it, and, it's, and I wish it didn't have to be the case. I wish I could go to weddings and be part of everything, and I, but I can't, and that's just how it is. And, mm. Can I suggest something, please? Uh, would you have one person address the questions this way? There will be a reduction in the amount of time per question. Sure. And because there were so many questions and the time is going to fly fast. Well, the time is going to fly no matter what. I, I, we could, even if we did this as, as, as 
um, quick as possible. Question after afterwards after, at the end they can go to each person and ask some questions. After that. Sure, sure. Um, I think that's a that's a good suggestion. Um, yes. First and foremost, I really would like to applaud your courage and the stance that you took yes. for. What you this and I am happy that you guys are here in the United States. We stand for freedom of speech and freedom of religion. So thank you. So, I have a hundred questions but I'm going to narrow it to two. Um, for Hiba, Saudi Arabia just recently allowed women in Saudi Arabia to, or I'm sorry, Baba. Okay. Um, they, in Saudi Arabia they allowed females to drive for the first time in history starting June 2018. So I would like to ask your opinion about that. The second question is, in January of this year, we saw a lot of women march and protest um, all over the country uh, wearing vaginas that resembled, uh, or wearing costumes that resembled vaginas uh, demanding respect. So. Uh, but one of the people who orchestrated and uh, organized this, her name was Linda. <laughs> okay, I want to I wanna talk about this. <laughs> okay, I would like to her talk about Linda. So <laughs> Linda Sarsour is one of the females that uh, I am very, con um, would like to get your opinion about how you guys feel about her. If you guys try to counter what she is doing and what she's saying. Okay, to answer your first question about women driving in Saudi Arabia, it's, uh, it's, a, it's certainly a step forward. It's a step in the right direction. And uh, there was an article that was released right after, I think it was in The Atlantic, and the article said that when the decree was issued, phone calls were, uh, they were phone calls to the female activists, the women activists that um, worked very, very hard for, specifically for women driving in Saudi Arabia, and they were told not to talk about it at all. Nothing negative, nothing, only praise to the prince for uh, this royal decree. So it is a, a both a positive and a negative, but a positive because, you know, more rights for women is always a great thing, and the negative because it's not attributed to the women that fought, and uh, some of them were e back in the 90s were even imprisoned and uh, were called horrible names and they were you know put in the newspaper as well as you know these nasty women and nasty was not one of the words that were used it was way worse than that so in a way i'm i'm happy and now i'm just hoping that next is the royal guardian system going down and now Um, so that's a big question, feelings about Linda Sursour. I mean, I feel like I could go on about that for some time. Uh, but just to, just to point out just a few things that I found most disturbing about her in, uh, inclusion in the Women's March. Um, if if some, of you, some of you might have noticed that uh, Women's March was actually started by, by this, this white woman. And then they pulled in other, uh, other leaders uh, who they felt like represented different communities. And the other leaders were there was a, a, a woman from a Latin background, um, a black woman, and then a Muslim. And I think this illustrates very clearly the racialization of Muslims and this, this, this consideration of Islam. So there's this whole idea that, um, well, you know, is Islam, I Islam is not a race, and, and that's the first thing that anybody, that anybody really talks about, but it's true that Islam is treated as a race, increasingly treated as a race, um, which is why we really need to, we need, really need to counter this idea. Um, there's, there was not a lot of thought put into why she belonged on that stage, other than uh, the idea that, well, she is a Muslim woman, and Muslim women are, 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 are you know, facing hostility in, in this atmosphere with, the, especially after the election of Donald Trump. So I really felt like it was a political symbol um, and not one that was thoughtful in what it actually meant and what it actually symbolized. And this sort of encapsulates my feelings with um, this feminism that we see, the way, the, the way that it's practiced. It's like this bubblegum feminism. It's not really a feminism that is thoughtful and not a feminism that is centered truly on, on women's rights. I mean, and as Hiba mentioned multiple times, that it, there really is a performative aspect to it. Um, and it really takes 
guts to be able to say, well, uh, there are women that are all, all around the world that are facing some severe, some, some se severe sexism. And it is sexism that is even, that is worse than the sexism that we experience here. And we need to talk about it and we need to be open about it. And we need to have these conversations while keeping uh, the idea in mind that Muslims as a people also deserve compassion. So I was just incredibly disheartened by the inclusion of Linda Sursour, and I won't be surprised if she continues her trajectory as being a progressive leader, uh, and uh, just I, I'm, I'm sure that she's going to run for political office or, or of some sort. I, um, and unfortunately, I think that's a representative of how, the, how pr progressivism as a whole is just sort of not too tied down to the principles that it should be tied down to. Okay, um, there's a lot of people, but I saw you raise your hand. First of all, I would like to thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I came from Muslim background too, and I totally agree with you that the women right in the Middle East and the Islamic Arabic world uh, have a lot of space for improvement. But, you know, it seems to me that we should look at the issue at a larger uh, angle. You know, the lack of democracy, at least in the Middle East, the Arab Middle East, and the corrupted government throughout the Arab world has a lot to do with how they treat their people. Like, uh, for instance, you know, uh, there is another, in other words, the oppression of people, it includes men and women in the Middle East. I mean, look at the, from Morocco to Kuwait, there is no one Arab country that can say we are a democratic country. So we should put this in the picture when we talk about it. I mean, the issue of women, it's not only the women who are oppressed, the men do. Can I take this one? Sure. Uh, to clarify, just because we're, we're focusing this panel on um, the, the aspect of women, women only one we can only touch upon so many things that influence this type of oppression. That doesn't mean that we're saying it's the only type of oppression and that these are the only factors that need to be addressed. Um, definitely everything that you mentioned in terms of um, corruption and, and uh, you know, people like to talk about imperialism and, and there, yeah, there are lots of things contributed to large scale inequalities across the, the Middle East and across the Muslim majority world in general. Um, and we can only address those things by addressing all of their particularities. Um, and there's only so much that we can, we can cover in a, in a panel like this. So. But don't you think that the different culture within the Islamic world has a lot to do with the lack of understanding about what Islam is? You know, of course, you know, I appreciate your experiences. I, I, think, I, think, that's, I think that's reductive. Do um, you think that your, your experiences can be applicable to the large Muslim community at large? Yes, I think we're talking about mainstream trends. I think we're talking about um, dominant structures that need to be dismantled. Um, and uh, of course, it's not something that can be applied to every single person or every single community. I mean, the Muslim majority world is vast. Tons of diversity and differentiation therein. That doesn't discount the fact that, that these are essential problems and, and women's empowerment is crucial to the progress of any society um, and, and the progress of, of democratic, democratic values to begin with. It's not that it's either this is kind of like a, a cart before the horse um, issue the way that you're presenting it. We can't, we can't, we can't establish um, the, the egalitarian political structures unless we look at uh, what's at root behind them, our social norms and institutions. Um, and I think we need to move on to another question. Well, I can actually, like, I'm going to add one more thing to that. Um, you, we, we won't see uh, democracy flourishing in the Muslim world. Uh, we won't see women's rights flourishing in the Muslim world until the idea that the religion is a soul, uh, it's a soul um, way that we can know the truth about the world is completely, you know, c uh, destroyed. Um, when it comes to women's rights in particular, the first, the first people who will stand up against women's rights in the Muslim world are religious, uh, religious groups and organizations. In Pakistan, there was um, a few years ago, um, maybe two years ago, one. Um, there was a, finally a, a law passed against domestic violence, 
okay, a law that finally said that domestic violence is, is bad, it's illegal, you know. Um, um, so th this, this finally, this, this law came into the picture and the people that were standing up against it, the people that mobilized against it, uh, were religious groups and organizations. There were 35 religious groups and organizations that were set standing up to say, no, this shouldn't be allowed because Islamically, a uh, husband has a right to discipline his wife. So if we're talking about democracy is just another way where, where there are many, many Muslims who believe that democracy is not Islamic. So, so long as we're, we're having this conversation and everything is centered on what is or isn't Islamic, you're not going to have progress. So we need to, the conversation needs to be that it doesn't matter whether something is or isn't Islamic. What it matters is, is it, is it, is it progressive? Is it good for humanity? Is it centered on human rights? We need to just move past the idea that we can be rooted down to this religion in any way. Otherwise, you're right. We won't have democracy. We won't have women's rights. We won't have any of it. Um, can I give just <coughs> a bit? Um, <laughs> to, um, just to, to add on to that, the kind of like the Lebanon parallel to that, um, domestic violence was only very recently criminalized in Lebanon. I think it was 13 or 14. Um, and, uh, and it was kind of like a long judicial battle because a lot of draft laws were proposed time and time again that were shot down. They were generally shot down by the two, uh, the, the two most prominent religious organizations in the, in the country. And we're talking about the religious institutions, the religious elite, the people they like dictate what the, the norms and standards are. So Dar al-Fatwa, which is the highest Sunni authority in the country, Majlis al-Shia al-A'la, which is the highest Shia authority in the country, every single time a draft law was, was proposed, they, they both came out and said, this, this threatens the closeness of familial bonds, this is this, and, and basically, Domestic violence, beating your wife, was not actually even illegal, let alone the, just all the structures you need to enforce that type of stuff until very, very recently. And it was largely because of religious opposition. It was largely because of patriarchal, conservative religious opposition. Uh, the ladies at the back? Yeah. So I have a comment and a question. Um, where it's more like, um, in my opinion, um, a lot of those problems we have in our Middle Eastern communities uh, culture and religious way. Uh, basically, we were taught from my own age that people around us love us for a reason. Like they don't have that unconditional love for us. For example, if I do something, I might hurt my parents. If I am homosexual, oh my God, that's my life, but I'm hurting my parents. There is no such a thing as unconditional love in their terms. My friends, if I become an atheist, oh, they would, they would not like me. They don't want to hang out with me. They don't want to know me. I'm ashamed for them. It's not like I support you. You're my friend. You're my kid. Whatever you have, whatever you decide, your life, I support you. If you're wrong and you want to come back and you want a shoulder to cry on, I support you. We don't have that mentality in the Middle East. We have more of the mentality is this is how people are going to uh, gonna look at us and this is how you're going to carry yourself to keep us from people talking badly about us regardless of what is it, regardless if you're happy or not. And now I heard your, both of your stories and um, I'm sure um, it wasn't an easy decision to leave families back home and decide to start a new life. Um, but my question is, what was going through your mind? What was the process that made you like, you know what, that's it, I have to choose either me I completely agree with you with how our culture is. It's very conditional. I can only love you if you follow a certain path. And that is unfortunately the way my mother has been raised and that's how she also shows her conditional love to me. Her love to me is conditional on me being, you know, uh, hijabi, wearing modest clothing and practicing Islam the way she wants me to practice it under her eye. And going back to your question is uh, what was going through my mind. So um, after becoming an, athe an atheist, and I, that was way back in 2011, I had just graduated, graduated from college and went back to uh, Saudi Arabia to work. And, live, and I lived under my family's rule. I had to wear a hijab, of course, because it was Saudi Arabia. And I didn't really have as much freedom as even my friends back then, like even going out to see my friends was a hassle because I had to tell them where I was going, who I was going with, how long I was going to be out, and uh, what I was going to be there. And of course, my phone had to be with me at all times in case one of them calls, and if they do call, I had to be in complete quiet, just in case you know 
they hear something that they didn't like and then I have to come up with a way to uh, explain it. I was living pretty much a double life. It, and even though, and as one of, the th one of the things that I have been asked, like, don't you think what you're doing hurts your parents? Why don't you just, why, why were you lying this whole time? You think I liked lying? It killed me. It absolutely destroyed me. It made me depressed. And I had to, yeah, it was, it, I didn't have any option. I thought, I really believed that if I had, if my family knew anything about me, that I would probably give my dad a heart attack and he would die. And um, because, you know, and, and it just, it really was not easy. But uh, I, one of the, the thing that really did change was I sought help. I went to a psychiatrist and I had a therapist. And the more I went to them, uh, the, and, and the more I went through the treatment, and it wasn't just, and it wasn't drugs that got me to go out. It was a book that I read. And I still can't remember the, the book's name, but I remember that it was about getting out of the victim mentality to, uh, and one of the things in the book that really stood out to me was a chapter about relationships with your family. There's only so much you can do with your family. You can't change them, but you can change how you react to them. And the way that they react is not your fault and you're not to blame for it. You did not cause your parents to uh, be angry or sad. Whereas the way we grew up, uh, it's no, it's when your parents are sad or you're angry, it's because of you, because something you did. It's because of the way we, because the whole, you know, conditional love thing. And once that got out of my head that, you know what, now I'm free. I can do whatever I want. And you know what, Saudi Arabia is not the only country in the world. You know, the earth is vast. I can be in anywhere in any place. But the one thing that got me to go and book my ticket and leave was when my dad, uh, was really angry with me, with me trying to like push the limits and told me, you know what, you know, I can go to your workplace and tell them that you know, you don't, I don't want you to work anymore and then you get to stay here under my eye and I can watch you 24 hours a day. And that scared me. And so I booked my flight and got out. Um, can you just... Oh, okay. Sorry, we're just do, we're ignoring you guys. Okay, we'll we'll, we'll turn over. Um, uh, the I, I'll just add one more thing to to that. Um, when the the most toxic thing about an honor culture is that it encourages narcissistic behavior in family members. It encourages. Uh, mothers and fathers to to look at their children's actions and say, well, if they b disbehave, if they're deviant, uh, it will reflect on me and the community will treat me horribly too. So it encourages this kind of mentality where you police each other. Mothers police their daughters and what's not understood is that the, 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 that mothers often have a very active role in enforcing you know, modesty norms uh, among their daughters to make sure that they live a good life, but also that the community doesn't come back and harm them in any way. And my parents, who are somewhat accepting of me, have faced, now, now what's happening is that I'm not facing any kind of serious issues with my parents, but they're facing it from their community. They're being ostracized from their community. They're being harassed with, with from, from, you know, cousins that I've never seen in my life, um, calling them and harassing them and, and, and telling them what are they doing and how could they do this. So there's this, this effect and it's very potent Right, precisely because it's a it's a network effect. It's not just one individual doing something. It's one individual, and what this means for everyone around you. Um. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it boils down to that. Um, um, Mainstream Muslim communities tend to be a lot more collectivist um, versus how individualistic the the U.S. and the West in general is. Um, and the th the thing is with when uh, I understand that the way my mother was controlling me my whole life, like. You know, I couldn't buy a piece of clothing without her signing off on it. Uh, every single, she had to know every single moment of every day what I was doing and with who. I know it was because she was terrified. She wanted me to have a good life because in her world, a girl who is like viewed as stepping out of the bounds of modesty is a girl who doesn't have a future, is a girl who is ruined is a girl who isn't going to find a husband, isn't going to have a, a, a life, isn't going to have a family, isn't going to have acceptance and safety and prosperity. I know that she was basically essentially micromanaging every aspect of my existence because she wanted me to be prosperous and safe. 
Um, and the idea that you could be prosperous and safe even if you were a, you know, a sinner, and I'm as big a sinner as they come, I'm a bisexual polyamorous atheist, I mean. Um, <laughs> and it's, at some point it gets to the, it gets to the point where like, is my entire family and what they think more important than, than my basic self-determination, because I had conflict about this. We all have conflict about this. When I, for, for the reason why it took me a while to come out to my family, it wasn't just that I was like nervous or anxious or afraid, it was also it was like, well, my mom's gonna take a lot of crap for this back home, and how is this going to affect my sister's prospects? I have a little sister. And at some point it was like, it was whether or not I could continue to survive the way that I was living, and I just couldn't, it, my survival was on the line. I knew that if I didn't leave Lebanon when I did, and I'd been trying for years, believe me, I don't think I would have lived another year. That's how miserable it was. I just couldn't exist that way anymore. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, there is a saying between religious communities and all religions that we should not judge the religion by its bad followers. So I was just wondering if the oppression that you were talking about, guys, is in true Islam or it's bad followers? This is my first question. Um, the second uh -oh. one is that you said, guys, that you, you established ex-Muslims because you needed a community and people were suffering and they need to hit. May I ask why they need to hit? What are the consequences, the risks involved if they came out? I heard about a war happened after Muhammad died it's called Hurub al mm -hmm. and people were killed just because they left Islam mm -hmm. after Muhammad died. So is that the punishment of leaving Islam, or is just bad people doing that? Do you want to take the second question? I'll take the first one. Sure. All right. Remind me of the first question again. <laughs> Sorry, it was in my head. It was in my head. So uh, anyway, followers. Followers. should not judge religion. My real Islam. Islam. All right. Real Islam. Oh, I love this topic. Real Islam is a red herring. Right? There is, there, there is a vast amount of diversity in the Muslim world. There is no agreement from one sect to another what, the, what set of principles and edicts and values constitute the core of the faith, even the, like setting the most minute d details aside, constitute the, f the core of the faith versus not. Like, okay, the sect of Islam that I grew up in, it was absolutely uncontroversial to the extent that like it was, it was almost viewed as. Um, yeah. But what about but the well, Islam, well, the Quran? Listen, listen, listen. <laughs> 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 it, it, it was it was basically viewed almost unthinkable of the idea that like hijab isn't mandatory. And then you have some people of some schools of thought that go like, no, the Quran never said that a woman needs to wear hijab in this way or whatever. And then you have other interpretations that say otherwise. You have people who are able to say, no, it's per perfectly possible to reconcile Islam in these ways. And the people who practice it, like, like you know, Ghada's parents, they thought the Salafis and the Wahhabis were wrong. The Shia think the Sunnis are wrong. The Sunnis think the Shia are wrong. Most Muslims think Ahmadis aren't Muslims and Ahmadis think that they're Muslims. It's just that there is no consensus on what the true abstract platonic form of Islam is and to continuously move the goalposts and say well these are just misinterpretations or these are just um, bad faith actors or these, these are just flawed people uh, you know uh, my mother used to always love to say it's it's Islam is perfect Muslims are imperfect but there is no one Islam that you can look at, that, that you can point to that and say that is representative of, of what Islam is and uh, without excluding and marginalizing some type of Muslim. And so, uh, and so we, I feel like we are less concerned with what a kind of like pr platonic form of the true real Islam is, especially because we're not Muslims. Like th that's a theological question. That's a question that's between every particular Muslim and, and their th th belief system and their God, what they think is the true path. As far as we're concerned, in a socio-political context, Islam is the conglomeration of Muslim practice and belief. That's what it is. 
And that is what we need to address. And Muslim practice and belief does have overarching institutions and norms and values. And you can point to their, the party, and, and it's going to differ. Like Some Muslim societies have a problem with FGM. Some of them don't. Some have a problem with girls not being able to be educated. Some of them don't. Our families had never had a problem with women being educated. That was not a thing. And, but the thing is, there's, there, there is, you just keep, if, if you are just focusing on whether or not this practice or belief is really Islam, then you're basically missing the point. It doesn't matter whether it's really Islam. It matters that it is there, that it is normalized, that it is propagated, and that it, hel that it basically is enacted in these ways that have real world consequences. And that's what we're, we're concerned with. I actually don't, I mean, I don't have a lot to add to that. I think that she, she covered, um, uh, uh, the, I think she covered that, that second question in, in, in that um, a lot of apologism goes to, they'll point at this one verse that'll, they'll be like, oh, but this, this, this one verse that says, you know, accept all people, whatever, and, and this, this, this means that this harmful practice in, is not actually Islamic, that it's not rooted in the religion at all. Um, this is so, such a common, this is such a common trope that I'm actually like, I'm just going to address it very generally in that to say what Hibba said about what true Islam is, is also the definition that I think that should be considered. So, so long as the vast majority of Muslims uh, consider apostasy uh, to be, to be a, a criminal matter, um, so long as many of them consider us uh, as people that, that, that should be, that should be punished in one way or another. I mean, there's so many governments, uh, Muslim majority governments around the world that do punish um, uh, apostasy or, or even blasphemy of any kind. Um, some of them actively go to persecute uh, blasphemy. Pakistan, for example, is expanding this and is um, they're, they're, they're spreading this to Facebook where we're there going into Facebook posts and finding, oh, this guy, one guy, the, he, he blasphemed, now, now we're going to arrest him and um, you know, he'll be faced with, 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 with the punishment for that. So uh, to the extent that, that can you find a, contra a contradiction uh, to, <laughs> to, to certain things in Islam, uh, yes, you can. It's a very contradictory text. It's actually, this is why it's man-made. Uh, there are quite a bit of it that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and you're going, to be able to, you're going to be able to find justification for a lot of things. But the problem, the problem uh, is that that religious fundamentalists will always have the ju all the justification that they need. They will always be able to say when it comes to women's rights that the Quran gives uh, the man the authority to discipline his wife. And they will be always be able to point to that verse and say, it says clearly that, that, a, man has this, that a man has this right. Or to point to a hadith or a fatwa. Or, 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 right. they, will, they will always have some sort of justification and they will then enact, uh, you know, godly justification behind uh, what is really kind of a twisted personal desire. So um, I think we need to keep that in mind and I think we need to consider that. And this is why the data of what Muslims actually think and how they interpret their religion, vast majorities of them around the world, matters. Sure. Yeah. I think, I think well, we, we, we've, you've had a few. So, um, I'm sorry. The guy yeah, the guy in the back. Yeah. yeah. Hey. Yes. Thank you very much for coming today. From Denver chapter, and thank you, Mohammed, for coming. Uh, I have a, a question. Actually, I have an opinion about it, and I'm very strong about this opinion. But I want to hear your opinion, guys, and whoever can answer this. What do you think, in like a few words, about the use of the hijab in the movement to resist? Like, do you, you must have seen that picture on social media. Yeah. The American woman wearing the American flag as the hijab. What yeah, do you think of that? I think it's contributing to the oppression of uh, women in the Middle East. Well, um, so I think I think we discussed some of this already with the Linda Sursur question, in that we have to be careful about what symbols we use and why we use them, and it can't just be well, we we mean it to stand for the dissent against real, uh, you know religious persecution of minorities. Um, we have to be more thoughtful about these kinds of things. I'm sorry, but I feel like we covered that already a little bit. Um, sure. That's a quick question. Um, I don't know if you covered this because I came a little bit late, but how do you balance like outside of academia and outside of maybe like these kinds of circles, how do you balance critiquing Islam while not leading into, because um, I come from a Muslim family, uh, I just don't want them to go through any discrimination. You know, I don't want to feed into any bigotry. 
So how do you balance that yourself? <sighs> that's a big question. And you know, <laughs> well, <With> difficulty. <laughs> difficult question. And that's, def that's, that's definitely something that I've seen time and time again as a reason why ex-Muslim activists choose not to talk. Because they say, well, I don't want to make things worse for the people that I love. And in order to not make that atmosphere fear, fear worse, I will choose to not talk about it now. But my opinion has always been that if it's not us, the people who are compassionate uh, and who can, who can look at Muslims and say, I stand for their rights to practice their religion, um, that I stand for you know, their rights as citizens in, in the United States, that I stand against demonizing, demonizing them as people. If it's not people like us who are standing up and talking about this issue, then it will be the people who, who, who hold all those nasty views. It will be this issue will just be seeded, this ground will just be seeded to the worst elements of society who absolutely don't care about the well-being of, of Muslim Muslims. So I think somebody needs to stand up and it should be us. Just to add on to that, we, it, this is really hard because we face, face an issue with the stuff that we talk about is very, very easy to be co-opted and twisted, especially by, uh, let's be frank, the right wing, who, are, who try to talk, who, who kind of use things like oppression of Muslim women or whatever, and they're really, really, uh, what's, what's the word? Uh, uh, hypocritical about it because they endorse many of the same conservative values and so on. Um, and they, they basically use it. They're just using the play. They're using us in order to further their own bigotry, their hatred and, and narrative. And so we have to resist being co-opted on that side. And at the same time, we have to continually speak out against anti-Muslim bigotry because of this environment. And at the same time, we have to also somehow reconcile that with the fact that like, yeah, Racism is a force to be contended with when it comes to the, pro the problems facing Muslim communities. So is honor violence. So, it, you know, so are all these various forms of oppression and bigotry against queer people, against, oh, it's so hard to be trans in, in a Muslim society. Um, I, against, we call ourselves ex-Muslims for a reason, because there is so much stigma surrounding the very idea that you could possibly leave the faith. Apostasy itself is as stigmatized as, as murder. Uh, uh, sometimes, yeah, and and we can't we can't forego one of these causes for the other for fear of enabling anti-Muslim bigotry. We can't uh, we can't suddenly start being silent about all of these other problems because those are problems that need to be addressed too, and we would be enabling those problems with our silence. And I, I mean. I am of the opinion that the other problems plaguing, plaguing Muslim communities are far more grave in their actual material effects in terms of how they impact people's lives than uh, you know, just even just the violence than anti-Muslim bigotry is. Um, and we have to find a way to talk about all of that without our narrative being co-opted by the right and without uh, also you know, falling into bigotries ourselves. It, it involves a tremendous amount of nuance and parsing and, and quibbling and, and people policing our language and we have to end up fulfilling the expectations of people completely outside of, 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 of the scope of everything that's going on because they have standards for how we should be talking about feminism and things like that. And so yeah, we do it with great difficulty and it's a very uphill battle. We find almost no like mainstream liberal venues that will listen to us long enough to realize that we are not who they think we are and that type of thing. So <laughs> I think, um, I think, Sean, uh, how much time do we have? We don't, not much, right? Um, yeah, we're, we should be wrapping up. We should be wrapping up, yeah. So um, there was a lot of, there was a lot of good questions, but. Um, yeah, it, it's 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 about eight. It's about eight. Yeah, we we could so we can we can get we can get your question. Um, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. I first of all commend you for your bravery and everything. I am from Libya. I'm an Arab. I'm a Muslim. I don't call myself a devout Muslim. I'm a practicing Muslim. I believe in that ideals of Islam as well as Judaism, Christianity, as well as the good ideas of the agnostics and 
uh, atheists. Atheists. The point here is, I would like to ask you, and also invite you, if the answer is no to my question, invite you to look at the Islamic world outside of Saudi Arabia and outside of the region of Lebanon you, Hiba, is talking about. I lived in Lebanon six months. I've, I, if you have a comment, please say it out loud. Okay, uh, I have. I have looked at Islam outside of just, the realm. Let me just finish. <laughs> Feminism that you talk about. I am 69 years old. I can remember as back as 1955. We had the best, perfect example of feminism in Libya. And controlled and directed women ran their own uh, activities, supported by men officially from the government institutes and from men on the individual level. Pakistan. I'm sorry? What about the women now? In now, now it's the Does opposite. It you know why? Because it's no, controlled it, 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 by... You, you know, I'll tell you why. i tell you why not. Thank you very much to the West who imposed on, in Libya Al-Qaeda, ISIS... So why are you living in the United States? I'm living in the United States, the United States because okay. I... Well, 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 okay. Can I, right, you guys can, can have this something? debate afterwards. Let's, right. let's address. I am going to answer... I'm living here... Excuse me, let's, let's address your question. Okay, so your question. Have I looked at Islam outside of the realm of Saudi Arabia, outside of Lebanon, outside of the Islamic world? Yes, I read the Quran from cover to cover numerous times. Uh, the Quran instructs um, women to cover. It, the Quran says that the... Show me, show can you not, can can you you not interrupt, that? please? Tell can me. you please not interrupt? Let her finish. للذكري مثل حظ الأنثيين. Isn't that? My opinion is wrong. Of course it's wrong. That's in the Quran. That's it. That's it. That's how I looked at it. The Quran is wrong. Roger. Yeah. In Saudi Arabia, okay, when the prince or any of the household steals, they're okay. Okay, uh, hold we on. Talk after. I, I need want, to ask you to stop here, right now. So can talk, we can I need talk to after. ask you to stop right now because this is not your platform. You, oh, no. you, you get you pose the question, and we're going to address it. And you are an audience. Uh, an audience. This is not your platform. You pose the question. Let us address it without response or interruption. Let us finish our thoughts. And then we can have, uh, move on to that. Would you want to move on to him? <laughs> he wants to, uh, he's been All right, wondering. Wait, no, 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 I want to say something. This is, we get this a lot, this whole idea that you wouldn't have this stance if you had looked outside the limited perspective of blah, blah, blah context. You aren't familiar with the other, you know, the other ways of thinking and interpreting and blah, 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 and this, and there are reasons like Western imperialism and, and so on that are responsible for, for all of these things, and you are basically doing the wrong thing by saying what you're saying. This, this, is, this is presumptive, paternalistic, to assume that we're speaking from a place of ignorance, that we haven't heard, digested, and reflected long upon all of these arguments, that we don't have nuanced stances that go beyond our experience, just because we happen to be speaking from a place of experience. And it's, it's, and especially when we are here trying to talk about and address a crucial issue, and constantly there are attempts to derail and hijack, derail and hijack in ways that are, you know, frankly, you know, it would be one thing if the points had any actual merit to them. But, they, but there's this, this idea that, like, you're just not looking hard enough to find the progressiveness. Or it's these other reasons why such things are problems. And let me tell you as a man how women actually don't have it that bad. Or if you look at it in this way, it's not so... It's, it's, it is not the way that we should be having these conversations, but it is so often the way that these conversations are had. And we're here right now to change that, which is why we're not giving platforms to this anymore. Can you let the, the gentleman speak? Yes, go ahead. Okay, can the guys are talking. Uh, so how does the, I guess, the language you, get, you use get weaponized? So, but how does, 
what do you, I guess, how does the language of someone who's outside of the community of Islam or um, never had any relation to it, how does criticism from people, I guess, like me, who's completely outside of it, get weaponized? Um, and sort of how is the best way for not people not inside of the community to uh, support you? Well, there's a, the, 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 the basis for, for activism that is actually helpful is to, is to not try to be, to equally apply <laughs> principles to both, to both uh, sides. And I've seen this with, we've seen this with um, people who are, as Hiba mentioned, people who are kind of on the right wing, people who will say that, well, uh, hijab is terrible, but they will kind of uh, acknowledge that modesty is maybe a good thing. And, you know, maybe, and, and they sort of under, under, um, uh, underlie the same sort of, of principles. So if progressives can really look into their own values and apply them uh, and try to be as, as, uh, as to try to have as little hypocrisy in the way that you choose to apply them as possible, that would be a really good starting point because we don't see that in, uh, on the right today and we don't see that on the left today. And that makes political discourse impossible. So if you're going to talk about um, women's rights issues, w talk about them in every context, in every context in which they're relevant, and show that it really is a principle that matters to you and not that you're specifically targeting this one community. I guess my question is a little more related to this. Does um, language used by people outside of the community get weaponized inside of the community to say, oh, hey, the West is bad because of they say these things? Is that oh, oh, yeah, God. well. <laughs> it really I mean, depends on my opinion. My question is, I guess, what's the best way to combat that? I'm I guess Sarah said it all. I mean, it just depends on, oh, God, it really just depends on who you're talking to is the biggest one. Know your audience would be the biggest one. I mean, it's different when you're um, in, a, in a skeptic society addressing people that you think were coming here because they want to hear you know, people that are not religious talking about their experiences and uh, what they believe, you know, feminism, Islam, modesty, uh, that sort of thing in women's rights. And if you're talking to somebody else, you also change kind of your language when you're speaking to them. How it would be weaponized and how to avoid it. And honestly, I don't think there is a way to avoid it. It will not always, entirely. not entirely. Not entirely. Uh, I mean, sometimes you say something and then suddenly it's on Breitbart. I mean, it's something that, that happens. I, uh, I think maybe I might have, I don't know, do I understand your question right? You're asking how things that people outside the community are weaponized by people in the community inside the community? Yeah. All right. Um, and how that can be avoided. I think the, the fundamental thing to acknowledge is that it is not the responsibility of people outside the community to uh, try to use language that will not, that is to, and so as to avoid having that language be weaponized. Um, it, that is, that is, a, that is a, a problem that has to do with the norms and values inside the community itself needs to be reformed from within. So to, to give a very concrete example, a lot of, a lot of progressive um, uh, and, and liberal values and principles are viewed as sinful, deviant, demonic, um, they're demonized. Just the way that the West is spoken about in some Muslim communities is like, you know, you, you'd think they'd be, people were talking about Satan himself or something. Um, and there's no way to really get around that because no matter how nuanced and, and, and progressive and compassionate your discourse is, it is not your responsibility to have other people avoid taking it and twisting it into their own, uh, to, to fit basically the, the, their own worldview. And that is, and, and for that to stop happening, the change has to come from within. It has to be the way that we talk with our families when they start talking about queer people, when they start talking about trans people, when they start talking, the, you know, the racism that, that's, that's threaded to, uh, throughout um, Arab communities against black people and South Asians, uh, just stuff like that. These are, these are things that, that we need to be addressing from within and trying to, and, and, and I feel like the, the purpose of discourse is not to try to um, fashion your terminology in a way that cannot be weaponized, because it can always be weaponized. And the issue is with the people who are doing the weaponization and why, what is underlying that. And that's an, uh, pretty much an internal issue. You blue in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I'm getting you guys with my rant, but you've 
kind of networks you might know. My perception of Iran has always been that it's got like a really kind of young population because there's a big baby boom after that religious takeover in the 70s. And I get some notions that they are like somewhat more Western. They have a film industry. Occasionally you see Iranian independent films. Um, from your experience talking to people, do you think there's any truth to the notion that Iran might, like the demographics in Iran might be changing to the point that you might see a little bit more westernized Iran over the coming decades? Or do you think the sort of current religious paradigm there is going to persist for a while? Well, as a person that has been to Iran a few times, even though I'm not really Iranian, um, the, you are correct in, uh, in assuming that, yeah, the, demo, the younger demographic is, is not just the younger demographic, even the, de the demographic that participated in the 79 revolution before it was hijacked by the, uh, by the Ayatollahs. It was, they are very educated. They're very, they know their rights. They know what, um, uh, I'm not gonna say Western, mainly because, I don't know, uh, I don't want to, like, maybe they're liberal. They, they, know, they know what their rights are. They, they fight for them. And the bad thing about Iran is that it's a very authoritarian regime. It's very brutal. It doesn't allow dissent in at all. Maybe in the next generations, but I don't think in our lifetimes, unless another revolution happens that doesn't get hijacked by religious authorities. I'm sorry, I mean, I don't, none of us here are from Iran. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a question for a political analyst. I think there are far too many factors for us to actually be able to predict whether the theocracy can be upended. And the fact that there is a more progressive, newer generation is maybe a necessary but insufficient condition for that. It's just really, really hard to comment on, on with a prediction. Do you have a question? Um, so I don't want to, like, put too much of a comment before the real question, uh, but I did want to just mention, I think, because Leila, you had said something to the end of um, men being blameless in Islamic It's society. Rada. And I, I, then you had like, elaborated on some other stuff. Right. Uh, it was, it was, it was Rada, side. yeah. Um, uh, I just wanted to like throw the caveat that growing up uh, in a Muslim household, there's a lot of imposition placed upon me, um, and I'm not a man uh, that I'm identified blah, blah, blah. But just even aside from that having male gender roles assumed upon you, there was the, you had to not have your um, shorts below your knees. Sure. There was a high, you know, there was a sense of control as well. So I just wanted to, to say from even not being a guy growing up and like not knowing it, um, there was a lot that was imposed. Um, and there was a lot of and there, 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 there. and narcissism. So I just wanted, because there are other audience members that maybe don't know that anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah. Out there. Okay. Um, and then the question that I had is, I mean, this is obviously like really difficult, but the topic and the nuance in it. But what kind of outreach or goals do you have within maybe the Muslim community or resources or refuge to attract people that want that support or want that uh, ability to step outside of familial control, uh, systems of dominance and power, uh, but also like you know play that that line of like. If you're coming from a system uh, in which even if you questioned it, you want to be like accepted and then not have this like harshness like imposed upon it. And I, mean, I guess I'm wondering like one, what's your audience? Do you have any like resource or out refuge or like anything that you're trying to do within the Muslim community or connection building in that sense? Not to try to say that you're trying to like disconnect, but there's a natural schism there because sure. of the subject matter. Sure. Um, so can, can I get your, just clarify your last question. You said, how are we working within Muslim communities or, or trying to? Or do, do you, would you like to tell me anything about, and it's not saying like you should be, I'm just like curious because that's like what I've like always been interested in is, do you have any like connections? Do you have anything like else that you're trying to do? Or what's, what's your like desire or outcome from this other than, you know, uh, promoting uh, quality, great things? Well, I mean, I feel like those are, those are, uh, Th those are sufficient to be going on with at the moment, um, but I, I I will say I, I mean we would be we would love to work with with Muslim communities. Unfortunately, because of the stigmatized nature of apostasy and uh, because of how outspoken we are about the religious roots uh, of these issues, uh, we find ourselves you know not really welcomed within Muslim communities, uh, even progressive Muslim communities. I mean there's 
quite a few progressive activists, and I've heard this, like, I've heard this said by, I, I won't say who, but a, a very well-known progressive um, woman, woman activist who, 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 who said that ex-Muslims uh, actually, they're, they're just as bad as the Taliban because we are agreeing with the Taliban and in their interpretation of Islam. Uh, so there's a, quite a bit of hostility that I have faced, um, and especially with progressive Muslims um, and the movement, the progressive Muslim movement, because their goals tend to be uh, th very different than ours in that they, uh, their, well, their approach, sorry, not their goals, their approach tends to be very different than ours in that they will go, they will approach it by saying, well, there are there's actually no problems within the true interpretation of Islam. And if everyone interpreted Islam in the very peaceful way that we do, we would not see any of these problems. But of course, our message is, is, not, is not that at all. We're saying there are problems and there are, 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 they're in the text and they are rooted within, within the text and there's a deep connection uh, between them and, and the way that the religion has been practiced uh, for, for millennia. So um, from that perspective, there is a little bit of friction there, but of course we would love to work with progressive organizations to just further causes that we both agree with, like uh, you know, LGBT rights or, or women's rights. Can I ask um, the uh, To kind of like, um, that being said, we don't have to work within Muslim communities to provide things to people in Muslim communities. And that's a lot of what we're trying to do with this organization. We want it to be known that if you are questioning, if you are dissenting, if you feel stuck, if you feel trapped, if you feel alone, that there is a place for you to go. There is a place for you to go where you will be accepted and welcomed and, and belong and assisted. Because we have people who, you, you know, it's either uh, you know, either they live in the closet or they're homeless. Uh, we have people who, you for, we have this kind of joke where, where like all of us, before we started forming the organization and like became more public when we were just a small group, we're like, oh, we th I thought I was the only one. Because just so, some things in the way that we were was so unthinkable, the question that you feel like a deviant for even being that person who thinks that way and wants those things. And for all you know, there could be someone like you in every house. It's just that there's so much silence around it that you don't dare to speak or seek it out. The fact that there is an ex-Muslim in North America now, and we're just like, what, four years old now? Um, if you had told me just six years ago that this could be a thing, I would have told you, like, you, you horse shit. <laughs> and, and it's not that ex-Muslims haven't always existed. I'm sure they've always existed in every single Muslim-majority society in the world since, the, since there have been Muslim-majority societies. You just don't see them. The fact that we are here, and that if there is anyone who is gender non-conforming or just questioning or just, just doesn't feel right, doesn't feel safe, doesn't feel like the community and lifestyle they, they are constrained into belongs, is where they belong, and at the same time they don't feel welcome or understood in non, in never Muslim spaces as we call them, uh, like there is only so much acceptance and understanding you can find from people who don't have a shared background. And we provide that. We provide that in a public way so that people can reach out to us and they can have a community. Because if you don't, if, if you are within a Muslim society and that's all you've known, that's what your family is and that's wh where your community is, and it's not for you, then you have no community. And we are the alternative. I'll actually add on to that a little bit. Um, one of the, when we were, when, when the, the organization was just coming, coming uh, to fruition, uh, Muhammad is here and, and this is his anecdote, but I'm going to share it. <laughs> um, that there was a lot of pushback um, against the name, ex Muslims of North America. Uh, a lot of people considered it very hostile, um, a very aggressive, and they were like, why are you being so, why are you being so in your face about this? I mean, as if it, we were being impolite to, to just name the, the, the organization what we actually were. Um, and, and Muhammad actually, he, when we were first starting, he had a conversation uh, with, um, he, this, this is Muhammad, he's, he's right here, he's, our, he's the president of ex of North America, he's here helping us out. Um, uh, he had a conversation with a, a leader of a humanist organization who said, "Well, you know, do you, what did you what do you think about changing the name to something to something less less aggressive sounding?" Uh, and he was he was saying this because he was he was thinking, "Well, from a marketing perspective, you know, this is this is it's very upfront about who you are and what you stand for." 
Um, but we fought for it, and we really thought long and hard about kind of like the awkward ac you know, acronym and everything that we have to work with, but, but that we wanted to be ex-Muslims of North America. We wanted to be upfront in the name because this, this, uh, the stigmatization of apostates makes progress impossible for everyone, including progressive Muslims. Because the first thing that anyone will say in Muslim communities when uh, a progressive Muslim even, like someone who is, or a liberal Muslim says, well, you know, I don't know about, about this practice, even though it might have religious roots, we should, just, we should just move on. The first thing that happens is that they get called an apostate. And, and, and then they suffer all the, all the, you know, the backlash that, that people like us actually do suffer. So the first step is to, is to say that, look, there's nothing wrong with being uh, someone who leaves a religion. There's nothing wrong with being an ex-Muslim. So that when, when reformers and, and liberals from within Muslim societies, uh, you know, try to reform their faith from within, they don't get, you know, stuck with our, our label, which is just so damning and just so difficult to move forward from. <laughs> <laughs> so kafir, just the, the word for unbeliever, just so you, you know, in the linguistic sense, it doesn't really have a negative connotation in the way that it's used and weaponized. It's a slur. Kafir is a slur. You call someone a kafir, you're basically dehumanizing them. You're saying that they, uh, they are the worst thing that you can that you can be. Um, and they, in when there are so many places in the world where um, where people believe that apostates deserve the death penalty or violence or ostracization or whatever. This is the same principle that has been used over and over again. When what you are is basically stigmatized and used to dehumanize you, then it becomes powerful and necessary to take that and to come out front with it. Say, no, I am not, uh, you know, I am going to call myself bisexual because that's a foil to heterosexual. I'm going to call myself an atheist because that's a, a foil to, uh, uh, to the, the uh, um, what do you call it, the, the theocratic normativity of the world. We call ourselves ex-Muslims because it's a foil to the stigma and the, uh, and the dehumanization that comes with the concept of leaving the faith. And it's something that so many people struggle with actively. And when someone calls you a slur, we, you reclaim that slur. And that's kind of it's kind of the same concept. Mm -hmm. The lady at the back. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 We'll go back. To you. Um, yeah. I don't know if um, there might be members of the audience that could answer this just as well. I don't know. I live in a part of Denver, um, about two or three miles from the largest mosque in Colorado. And uh, so we have a Muslim community in, where, in the neighborhood where I live. And I see in many of them are recent immigrants. I'm not going to give them the immigration thing. That's, no, not going there. But, okay. but um, and I, I, you know, just going off about my day. And uh, at the park, for example, across the street from where I live, all summer, the women are out there with their children. The women are the complete burqas, not just the hijab, but the burqa. But the little girls, many of them have the hijab. They go to public school in Denver with other kids from other backgrounds. And I just wonder, you know, I don't really know how insular the Muslim communities are in the United States. Um, I know there's an issue with that somewhat in the UK. But um, I, I'm hoping that the exposure to the larger, you know, to the larger community here would facilitate some sort of, some sort of moderation or some sort of I, I don't know. Um, that's why I'm I'm throwing it out to you. But I, I mean, I'd like to be hopeful about that. Um, I think exposure to alternative ways of living and, and kind of like interacting with with the larger world definitely helps. You, you know, just even even having an. Even as ta going to, you're right, just going to school and seeing that the people around you who are of different creeds and faiths and beliefs, that they're people just like you and they, and they are kind, considerate, compassionate, they're humans. Uh, that, that does help and I think that it's not a coincidence that a lot of us who break out, it's because, it's because we've been exposed to other ideas. And of course you can be exposed to I those ideas and still, you know, cleave strongly to your own belief in your faith and that's fine. Um, but. But there's still a problem, but I think that's still radically insufficient. 
when it comes to breaking insularity, because insularity, it, 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 I mean, insularity doesn't just happen. There are mechanisms behind it. So like um, when I was younger, I went to an, an international school because my family, um, my father was working in Saudi Arabia, we were expats. And so I went to a school where I actually was one of the few girls who wore hijab in the entire school, you know, ironically enough. And I felt kind of like weird and stigmatized because of it. It was like, you know, mostly Canadians, Americans, Europeans in that school. And, um, and my parents were, were really, really intense about warning me not to get too close to the Westerners and not to, and not to give too much credence to their beliefs and not to be brainwashed by them and not to be overly friendly with them. So, the, and, and, and there are lots of mechanics like that where the way, because you know, interact, the way you interact with the public world is only a very, very small sliver of your social existence. And a lot of the time, it's, 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 it doesn't do much to dismantle everything else that's going on around. Which is not to say that like, you know, any individual needs to break away from their faith just because they're exposed to other viewpoints. That's not what I'm, I'm not endorsing that. I'm saying that in order for insularity to break, for, for the kind of like idea that it's wrong and bad to be anything else, and of these other people, you know, these Westerners are sinful and they're deviant and, and so on, exposure helps, but there also has to be change from within. There also has to be something about the sensibility, the way it's, it's talked about, the, the, that has to come from within, so. I actually live in your neighborhood. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> we came from Denver too. Um, just a small comment um, from experience too. Our parents bring us here at a young age, and they teach us you need to te you need to take the good thing from America: education, find a job, all of that. Culture? No. We will have our own culture. We will have our own standards. We will have our own religion. And for that matter, I'm not saying that's my personal experience, but a lot of those kids get to send to a mosque during weekend to teach them Quran and Arabic. Um, a lot of those kids wear hijab from a young age, not necessarily the religion says a young girl should cover up, but in general, I want to teach my daughter to be conservative from that age. So when she grows up, she will not hate hijab. But then most of those kids will get exposed to other culture, other people. And some of them, like myself, will have to realize the world is bigger than what we got taught, than what our parents told us, and what we see at home. The world is bigger just because somebody is different doesn't make them bad. And just because somebody doesn't wear hijab doesn't make them bad. And just because someone is not a Muslim doesn't make them bad. I, I, I'll add, that was a really good um, observation. Thank you for sharing. Um, I, I, just to add on to all of that, I think that this is why uh, I speak so often about uh, standing up for the rights of Muslims as citizens. It's very important that they feel comfortable uh, and they know that America is their nation too. Um, and the, and if, if they feel that way, then they'll be more outspoken and, and, more par and participate more readily in, in American society. And they should, because that means they get exposure to different ideas, some of which may change the way that they think. Um, and active and direct honesty has, has a lot to do with it, because there's just, there's so many ways, as Hiba mentioned, to just passively, uh, you know, just pass passively uh, keep, keep, hold on to, um, the norms uh, and the uh, the ideology that your parents give you. Um, so we need we also need to actively talk about the issues that the m that are common in the Muslim communities. And is we I think we consider to some extent that were problems that were just solved. Like we just don't have to talk about modesty culture anymore because American women are free to a certain extent. But of course, uh, that's not true for all Americans, and that's not true around the world either. So this is a debate that is alive and it should be alive and these are concepts that should always be uh, fought for you know by all women everywhere these are all I feel like all of these questions I could go on for just I for an hour at least um, but I uh, uh, so his question was um, how I felt about Majid Nawaz and his work. Um, he's, uh, he, he founded Quilliam Foundation, 
Um, is it a foundation? Um, but uh, 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 this organization called Quilliam, which is a counterterrorism organization, um, I think they started in uh, they started in England, and now they've expanded. Now there's a Quilliam USA as well. Um, and his approach is it's very interesting in that he is he is more direct than um, most progressive Muslims uh, when he talks about the problems with the religion. He'll say, here is here is this and this this verse and we just need to get rid of it um, we just need to move on if i'm correct in in uh, in understanding his viewpoint so i do think that there to, to a certain extent uh it is helpful to have that and it's helpful to have that voice and i absolutely support him in the same way i, I I support a lot of uh, progress, uh, liber liberal and progressive Muslims. However, uh, to the extent that um, uh, his perception uh, continues to center on, well, uh, let's work through the religious face. Let's justify uh, secular morality through religion. I just feel like is 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 an imposition that we don't need to have. It makes our lives more difficult. It makes it harder for me to argue for women's rights within the context of the Islam. I mean, I can twist myself into the shape of a pretzel and I can, you know, I can define words in a thousand different ways. And I mean, there's just so many, uh, there, was a, there was a feminist, a Muslim feminist who was trying to, who was trying to write a feminist Quran. And um, she was trying to define the word beat uh, in in a, in a different way, so that it can have a more feminist meaning, and she looked through, you know, she I, I think so many different words to find to finally hundreds of different definitions to find one that was mm, less like slightly less less horrific. So it's just it just makes uh, the fight for progressive like values for liberal values so much more difficult, and it makes them dependent on how uh, loose the scripture happens to be at the time. So you're always tied down to it, and I think that this is just um, this is just uh, um, something that we just don't need, and I don't see any value in it. And um, I think we need to move past this idea that anything needs to be justified by the Quran at all. It, doesn't matter what the Quran says. Um, what matters is what's right. What matters is, um, wh you know, what supports human rights and what supports li civil liberties. Yes, uh, the gentleman in the red. Um, I just want to say I think what you guys, uh, what you three are all doing, is extremely important. I, I come from an ex-Mormon background, and I'm pretty involved in ex-Mormon community and family members and friends and being there for people that are questioning. Um, so I definitely. In, by comparison, what you, you three are involved in seems absolutely heroic to me. Um, I, my question is, how do you balance your sanity um, <laughs> in terms of what you do and the lifeline you are for the people and the roles you're representing for, and, and balancing that against the things that you've left behind, the things you've given up, the family members, the relationships you've strained, the costs that come with them? So his question, his question is, um, how do you keep saying, or how do you balance um, between the work that we do and, um, you know, staying sane and, you know, doing normal things? I mean, my, yeah. m the short answer is to do it in little bursts instead of just doing it all at once. I mean, I honestly have no idea how Sarah does this on, like, full time. Uh, but I do it mainly um, whenever I can, really. I would love to help mainly because I know how very difficult it is to be in that situation. It really helps to have somebody that is there for you, that would listen to you. And um, what's great about you know ex-Muslims of North America, you have that in the community itself, that if you need to vent, you have those people there with you. If you just want to go out for a drink and not talk about that, because that's exactly what you can do as well. So um, the way I balance is that I would spend some time a little bit on, you know, trying to help, trying to coming to these events, speaking, um, and when I'm not, I just concentrate on work and concentrating on just doing my readings and watch puppy videos whenever I can. <laughs> that really helps. I mean, sometimes we don't achieve sanity, but the, the good thing is, <laughs> <laughs> the, the the wonderful thing about what we're doing is that it's. Yeah, it's draining and exhausting and, and just it feels like an uphill battle. But it's also the thing that often keeps us going and energizing us and energizes us. The fact that we have each other. We have this thing that we've, I mean, we, we lost a lot. We lost an entire community. Many of us have lost our families. And we just built another. And what we're doing is continuing to build that. What we're doing is, to, is continuing to make it so that 
you know, every new person that joins our organization, and there are new people every day, that's another person that has a safe, safe place. And that, we, sometimes I feel like there is nothing in the world that keeps me going other than these people. A, a, and uh, it's, it's both the poison and the whatever it's called, the antidote, so. Uh, have you to, already, have to, yeah, we, we need to, to wrap, wrap up. up. One, one okay, one more. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay, so you guys mentioned performance feminism, um, and as someone who's like a liberal and identifies as a feminist, what's your biggest recommendation to people that are in the community to make sure that they're supporting like the freedom of religion and the freedom of expression, but not encouraging like oppression that you guys mentioned that is inside the Muslim community? I'm all spoken out. Does someone want to take Just to listen. All, I, we, all we want is to be listened to. Uh, not to uh, quiet us down, not to shut us down, not to, um, not to put us down, not to uh, belittle our experiences. Uh, it's, you can tell very quickly if a person is being bigoted or if the person really has something important to say. Uh, and I understand, especially like from coming from a different kind of background, where uh, you probably—I mean, I'm, I'm not—I'm I'm assuming a lot here, and you can correct me—but you probably came from a more progressive, more liberal background than I did. <laughs> I'm just going out of a limb here. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but you know, if you came to me and you asked me like how about you know what I wanted to talk or Piba or Sarah or any ex-Muslim or any Muslim woman that has a different perspective than the, what the media portrays just listen that's all I have to say um, which is not to say that you should be passive about it and not form you know not form an opinion and not and not engage in critique if you feel like there's something wrong it's it's the idea that it, and it's funny because we're, we're trying to tell you to decenter yourself, but also telling you to not decenter yourself because part of the problem is how much you decenter yourself in favor of the wrong things. It's, it's just be, it's, it's about not enabling and shutting down a discourse because it, you, because you feel like it doesn't align with what you think the, the um, you know, the, the predominant trend in, in feminism is right now or whatever. Because w w ever since the first wave, feminism is constantly reforming, constantly messes shit up, constantly, you know, discovers that, oh, we've been throwing these people under the bus and we've been messing up in these ways. And all these ways in which we've been trying to help is causing all this damage. When we say listen, we mean let us do our work and, um, and, and just be, I, I guess, be, be perspicacious about how you listen to everyone who is talking about this from the various backgrounds. Um, and, 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 and uh, God, this, this is really hard to say. And, and, and the thing is, that I, I guess, listen without passing judgment, which isn't the same as listening without critique. Um, because you, you, can, you can have a very, very critical attitude that is still that still doesn't enable in, uh, enable one dominant narrative and and shut down another because it is it is true that narratives often compete with one another and um, there is a such thing as narrative hegemony and it's your job as someone who cares about this as someone who cares about being compassionate towards a group that you're not a part of it's your job to do your best to not jump the gun. Last question here. I, I, no, no, that's actually, that was the last question. Um, uh, so I just wanted to, you know, thank everyone for coming. Uh, this is, uh, we, ex-Muslims of North America, want to, we want to do these uh, more often. We want to do them everywhere. If you want to know more about our organization, I think we have some brochures hanging around somewhere. Uh, please pick one up. Uh, we do, a, there's a lot of other projects uh, that we're engaged in right now, and we're really wanting to be more active um, and do what we can to be a part of the dialogue. I hope you enjoyed this today. Um, so please, you know, if you if you liked it then then share you know our, our work a little bit you know just like tweet out <laughs> the, the 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 link huh Is there any way we can connect? we can con i don't i don't i'm not sure what that means
contact oh, cool. information is on, on the, the brochures. brochures yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So please, please take one. Um, and thank you all for here, for being here and for listening. Because I know this was long, but I really appreciate that you were here and you were such a patient and good audience. Thank you. Thanks.